we still have some technical difficulties. This is really a premiere here with our live streaming event and Mentimeter, and it just takes another two minutes, and then I think we can start. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Miku Utari, I'm the incoming director of Merix. Uh, this is our first and hopefully annual China forecast event. We have a packed room, a packed program, and uh, as I understand, the live streaming is also working, at least audio, so everything you say will be recorded and heard across the world. Um, we look forward to seeing the video also online, hopefully. Um, we're extremely pleased to have, uh, to welcome a number of terrific panelists today, fantastic experts uh, here in the room, and indeed also a great audience. Um, let me mention two things right at the start here. As I said, this event will be live streamed and recorded, so everything you say is also made available uh, to an even broader audience beyond this room. Um, hopefully it will not be used against you. Um, we are also very pleased and grateful uh, to our friends from the German newspaper Handelsblatt. Uh, we will have Nicole Bastian, the lead foreign editor of Handelsblatt, later on the stage here. Uh, Handelsblatt as our co-host for this event. Um, we organized this event to draw on the expertise that we have at Merix and among our network of friends and brilliant colleagues um, to take a little bit of risk um, and challenge ourselves to think about what trends we see in China and what the trajectory of Europe-China relations is. We also challenge you, the audience as well, as this is quite an experiment uh, that I will explain in a minute. Uh, it is an interactive effort to bring you into this debate this morning. What we do here is not meant to be predictive. It is meant to shake up and stimulate our thinking, help us start the Chinese New Year with new insights, help us asking the right questions, and think things through and prepare for challenges and opportunities we might face in our relationship with China. 2019 has already seen quite dramatic changes in China and in Europe-China relations. But three examples from just the last Days really show how difficult and at the same time important it is to look at trends and implications of actions China and we are taking these days. First example, the so-called first phase trade deal last week, if enacted and enforced, will have quite substantive negative side effects on German and EU uh, trade relations with China. Um, Second, there will be a decision today in the UK about whether Chinese suppliers will be allowed into, and to what extent they will be allowed into the 5G network in the UK. This will have ripple effects, effects across Europe, um, including for our own decision making here in Berlin, which is also quite imminent. Third, obviously the Corona virus crisis, a crisis that moves to the heart of the political system in China, but also to a certain extent questions the responsibility for German authorities how to handle this crisis and what appropriate behavior in such a situation is. 
And if there is one lesson we can draw from this, is it is indeed things move quickly. We need to adjust our risk map. We have to adjust our expectations regularly, but also with a clear sense of the overall direction of developments. Let me move on to the program and the proceedings, uh, which is the more complicated part um, for, of today. A uh, quick note of thanks first. Uh, we have a great team effort, lots of computers back, back there in the um, background. Um, uh, communications and events team have done great work. My colleague Lucrezia Pogetti on the panel later, Kai von Karnab, working in the background, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but now is the time that you pull out your mobile phones. Um, and if you haven't, um, uh, it would be fantastic if you could make uh, this work. Okay, great. So use your mobile phone to visit, if you can, this address, menti.com. Um, colleagues who have been in China for a long time can use their QR code. Um, others have to enter the code manually. Um, this brings you to a website that we will use later um, to gather your input and um, opinions on the questions that we will ask the panelists and that we will ask you today. Um, so while you will be doing this, um, I will give you a few more seconds. I'll try to introduce the program. First panel, political outlook. Um, I will only introduce the moderators. We have Sabine Stricker Keller here, um, the leading China lawyer for more than 30 years in Germany, a critical source of insights and wisdom for decision makers across Germany and beyond, also luckily a board member at Merix. Um, and she will introduce the panelists later. The second panel will be Economic Outlook, uh, moderated by Nicole Bastian, the foreign editor at Handelsblatt. Past lives include being a correspondent in Tokyo, leading Handelsblatt work on finance in Frankfurt. And the third panel uh, will feature a presentation of a Merix survey on Europe-China relations by Lucrezia Borghetti. And then we will move on to a political assessment um, that we will introduce later. Um, now, how will this work? I hope you've all managed to use your mobile phone and enter this address. Um, what we will do is that for each panel, we will put up questions. Uh, we will put up two questions twice. Um, and you will use your mobile phones, hopefully, at the queue of the moderators to make your assessments of the questions that we will pose here. Um, so a total of four questions per panel. It's two sets. Two questions first, you will answer them, and the moderator will ask the experts to share their um, views on your response, uh, responses and also on the subject matter. Um, <coughs> after these four questions for each panel, um, there will be Q&A, so you will have an opportunity to challenge the experts on the panel to let them know what you think and um, maybe what you think differently. So uh, for each panel, you will have twice the opportunity to answer two questions, and we look forward to uh, getting your opinions also here heard on this um, stage. So, I want to write, uh, get us started right away. I would like to ask colleagues from the first panel um, to get on stage. Uh, so that's Sabine Stricker-Kellerer, uh, François Bougouin, um, Volker Stanzel, and Christine Schekupfer. And uh, thank you for being here. This will be quite a ride this morning. So um, thanks for doing this with us, and we look forward to the discussions and the debate. Thank you. Ah, das war genau der Fehler, den ich machen sollte. you can all see us well. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Merix, for the invitation to moderate the distinguished panel here. It's quite intimidating for me because, as you just heard, I'm only a lawyer. So, uh, <laughs> welcome, Christine Schuhkupfer. She is our host as well and a director here at Merix on um, public policy and society. I go by order of the sitting, Volker Stanzel, former ambassador to China and Japan, and here in his capacity as representing Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik, uh, SWP. 
and Francois Bougon, also a long-term China journalist, has been based as Beijing correspondent for many years in China for the last, no, previous decade, previous decade, during the Olympics, okay, <laughs> and now working for Mediapart in Paris. So, all the rest of the bios you can read in the well-written uh, program. Uh, now we try uh, to go as Miko explain, uh, explained, as, as I hopefully understood. Uh, we will have two questions for you up there. We'll have the result of your answers, and then we discuss the two questions. They are so interlinked that we don't really have to distinguish them much during the discussions then. Uh, the first question comes, and I know Kai in the background is helping me, and he has his thumbs up, so that's fine. Uh, the question is whether you have all your thumbs ready uh, for your mobile phones. So the question is, you get f five choices. The question is, in your opinion, which course will China's leadership take in 2020? Okay, I read the five choices. If the print is too small for most of you, uh, I don't know. I mean, you started, did they start clicking already? That's why we have the numbers. You start clicking before you know the questions? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, uh, but, oh, you have them on there. Okay, so then I don't have to read them, okay? Okay, okay. Number one, Xi Jinping further strengthens his grip. Strengthening grip is number one on the bottom right corner, moving quickly. Second, the Chinese Communist Party reasserts collective leadership. That's not up there at all. Yet, inter-party opposition becomes visible. That's the upper left corner. CCP starts preparing transition. Nowhere seen. Others <coughs> at 2% at the moment. Kai will tell me when we are through. He doesn't know either, probably. Okay. Um, I think that's enough of a picture. That's more than a picture we need. We disregard the 1%. I guess I'm not a statistician, but that might work. Uh, so we basically have three quarter of all of you in the room going for strengthening grip of so leadership and one force saying we have some not only intra-party opposition, but visible inter-party, intra-party opposition. Okay. That corresponds a bit to the survey Merrick did with China experts, but the real China experts are here. So disregard the uh, survey you have somewhere on your chair. So that's how we remember, that we should remember, Kai is going to help me to remember that one because we said we have two questions, so I ask my three panelists, remember that one, which is easy because we only have two options here left. Okay, second question, which of the following issues will be the biggest test for leadership, CCP leadership? We got how many choices on our paper? Four. Four. Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang and others. Okay, this is so creative. I just got used to the circle. Now we <laughs> <laughs> have to redirect our minds to see some jumping balls, jumping back and forth. You are all in the lower right corner jumping somewhere. Um, again, it's quite a clear picture that Xinjiang is the neglectable part of the answers. So no test for leadership. So we have... Hi, my friend. Do we any, have any chance what others means? <coughs> no. Okay. <laughs> none, of, none of the above. What did you say? Coronavirus. Yeah. In the second part of our session this morning, we will specifically talk about the coronavirus. So we try not to focus, you know, 100% on this one right in the first 20 minutes, but try uh, for the second 20 minutes where our questions will be coronavirus in social credit system. So just that you can anticipate. So we are, uh, but uh, I also expected that Q2 will be pretty much coronavirus. But um, let's uh, see. So that's it. So we remember. It was nice. Thanks for, thanks for your vote. So it makes it easier to remember. So um, which course will China take? 75% Xi Jinping strength, strengthening his grip. 15% intra-party visible opposition. And here, the biggest issue is going to be Hong Kong and others, and a little bit Taiwan. Why don't we let our diplomat go first? 
on commenting <laughs> either on the outcome of uh, the survey or uh, taking the two questions together on your uh, thinking on the trends we have. Yeah, thanks. Uh try to take them one by one but make a remark beforehand because obviously um, this uh, exercise is about how does the, the communist leadership of China deal with very recent stress factors with uh, challenges and uh, Hong Kong obviously comes to mind now everybody as we see here thinks um, also of the coronavirus. I would say uh, uh, as a general remark that um, for most of these recent challenges there is one root cause and that uh, has a name, that is Xi Jinping. Uh, because on the one hand you have Xi Jinping trying to consolidate his personal power, but that is also uh, with the purpose of uh, consolidating the party's power. And here we come to a um, constant factor throughout the 70 years of um, the history of the People's Republic, which is you had a lot of upheavals, you remember of course the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen, etc. But one thing remained the same, that is the uh, Communist Party holding on to power ruthlessly, <coughs> relentlessly, and not giving in. And now with a person who has actually gathered more power in his hands than even Mao Zedong was able to, actual uh, structural power, I mean not charisma or so, um, you have this effort of consolidation at maybe the pinnacle of these 70 years. Now, um, what, how, how does the Communist Party do that? I said relentless, ruthlessly, in terms of tactics, it means never giving in an inch, never relenting against whatever kind of opposition there was. And you can look at the recent um, stress factors, uh, Hong Kong. Obviously, Xi Jinping had only one plan, which was not give in. And he's going to continue that. On Taiwan, we had the same factor, and it led to a defeat, actually. The root cause being Xi Jinping's uh, uh, strategy. And with the coronavirus, maybe it is a similar phenomenon. So uh, I think that as long as Xi Jinping is not, or his authority is not put into question, we will rather see a continuation of that kind of effort to not give in and in a wider interest, not only in the interest of Xi Jinping, but in the interest of continuing what the Communist Party has done very successfully over 70 years, which is stay in power. Now, as far as these questions are concerned, I think that means that um, as soon as you have stress factors not um, fully managed in the way uh, the Communist Party claims it will do it, then the authority of the Communist Party, and first of all, the person at the top of the Communist Party, will be put into question. And you see the first symptoms of that, not after Hong Kong, not after Taiwan, but as is reported in our media, you see it with the coronavirus. That here, suddenly, obviously, it is not even possible anymore for the internet censors to uh, control the um, cynical questions in the internet of the population, whether the leadership is really managing this crisis in the right way. So here we have the first time, I think that obviously, the, and openly for all to see who go on the internet, the authority of Xi Jinping is put into question. And the way this coronavirus um, crisis continues, uh, in this, uh, on the question one, I would uh, rather be uh, on the side of those who see that there is intra-party -party opposition against uh, Xi becoming visible. Visible, of course, not meaning that um, Bo Xi Lai escapes from prison and stands up uh, on Tiananmen <laughs> as the man of the opposition, but that you read more and more of it on the internet. That is how these things become visible in a, a country such as China. On the second question, um, well, this is very interesting. I think, first of all, uh, we can discount uh, uh, Xinjiang. One million people in concentration camps, and that is an issue, but it is an issue mainly in the West. It is not something that so far has reached 
the public and public opinion uh, in China itself. Um, on Taiwan, Taiwan, I think, is happy with the present situation. So is the Taiwanese population. And Taiwan's situation will continue to be as it is as long as it can count on uh, American support. So there's Hong Kong. Hong Kong, I think, uh, the Chinese leadership will try to solve in the way they did in 1976 six with Tiananmen, the then Tiananmen crisis, which is going after those who are with a protest movement, one by one taking them out, a silent way of crushing the opposition. And um, that may or may not be successful. It may happen that the protest movement uh, stands up against that. But the coronavirus virus, again, seems to me to be the hardest to calculate. And the way it has evolved so far, I think uh, it will be the major uh, crisis in the foreseeable future, let's say, in the course of this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christine, can we, can I just ask you the question relating to what Volker said on the visibility of the uh, intra-party opposition? So on the 15 percent, uh, no, what do we have? Uh, yeah, no, the 25 percent, sorry, on the 25 percent and beyond, please. Yes, it's a very important uh, point, Sabina and Sabina and Volker already pointed to that. I think, of course, as a political scientist, we have, with the colleagues, we have been thinking a lot what visibility could mean in the sense of how could we be able to really be as an was early on on these phenomena. And I, I do think visibility uh, could basically mean at least two things. On the one hand, related to information control. So you would see, for example, leakages by um, inter-party yeah, persons who would not would not be happy with the current course and would leak documents like we had with the um, documents related to Xinjiang abroad. Also, people would try to um, try to publish different narratives and different media in the English speaking media, for example, China Daily or the Global Times, but also in using the whole spectrum of the um, commercial media and China media platforms. And we have seen that in the past that people within the party try to test a certain narrative um, because it, of course, uh, theoretically, it has to go through the propaganda department always, but um, people, especially with high backing from the party elderly, have tried this um, before when it comes to foreign relations, uh, for example, also to Hong Kong, we have seen that. Uh, that. And another element of that also could be um, that um, a second element could be a policy, f f imp uh, sorry, failure of policy implementation that uh, party creators would resist. I mean, there's the pressure still, of course, from the ongoing anti-corruption campaign, but a kind of resistance to implement policy related to Xi Jinping, uh, again, also added because of the pressure from the anti-corruption campaign, but that could also be an indication of visibility uh, in, in the sense of uh, opposition. And a third element I'm just kind of thinking of could be if we see a spike in capital outflow as, as much as possible, or we see defections of Chinese diplomats, for example, as we have seen before in Australia in the recent years. So I think that's also important, of course, to think about indicators which would help us to um, to assess if there is an increased visibility of inter-party opposition. But I do think especially information control is a key element here. Um, Let me just jump in with one question. Why would you think that capital outflow would be an indication for visible inter-party opposition? Because couldn't that be also a sign for strengthening a grip on power? Oh. Well, for me, at least it would indicate, and of course it could indicate, let me put it that way, it could indicate that people, it's its a sign of insecurity, people with power and the means who, who would be able to move up, move their capital and their people eventually abroad, it, it would, for me, it would signal a less uh, degree of, of, of confidence in the current system and the current regime. It could at least be one indication. We get back to you on, on the next one, but Maurice, um, when we talk about the uh, Francois, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm so bad about Francois. I'm sorry, <laughs> just looking. Um, the biggest test was CCP leadership. We we identified the biggest test, but what does it mean in substance? You know, we say we have a test, but what will be the triggering, the triggering parameter 
uh, whether the test is successful or not successful. It's quite hard to, to answer this, just this question. I just, I just want to like a follow up to to our conversation. Um, okay, yeah, everybody agrees that uh, Xi Jinping will just get more uh, get the grip on the power. But I think um, it's quite interesting to have this kind of conversation right now during the virus crisis because I think it changes the landscape right now. Um, I think could be something good for Xi Jinping and something bad. Something good, bad because uh, what we see from Wuhan, it's a loss of faith in the state party credibility, so it's sure. But at the same time, I think he can use this kind of, of crisis to, to get the grip more on the power. He, we, we already seen that he's, um, he, he created a, a special group. He sent Li Keqiang to the ground. Uh, there will be more propaganda, the full uh, on national unity, uh, mobilizations uh, around, the, around the party. But so, so I, I think it's, it's quite early to, 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 to predict what's going on right now uh, with the virus, but it could be something uh, after the last year, was, which has been very hard for him, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and uh, Xinjiang. Um, I think could be... A, a, a moment he can he can say you know like the kairos and uh, just to send the military to the ground and just to mobilize mobilize all the society around like the national unity and this is the propaganda he likes to to move and to uh, to use uh, to to for for his own uh, power <laughs> So the grip on power, that's what you say concerning the, the virus. When we look at the survey, when Merix did the survey, that was a pre-virus survey. Um, the hit list was Hong Kong with roughly 60%. And if you compare that, uh, asserting the grip on power and at the same time lack of trust in the, in the virus, we get to that, that later. What, what is different with the Hong Kong issue where we had 60% last week as the biggest test? I think the difference is that um, Hong Kong. I, I, I just spent some uh, recently. I, I, I spent some time in Hong Kong and Taiwan, and what I saw it's what all the young generations again sitting being on his his own model and on what he wants to do in, in China. Um, but this is something he can't he can't handle. It's something like uh, external. It's a uh, external policy, in, in, we, we can say. Uh, here, in, with the virus, it's, it's in its own um, periphery, it's an own country. So I, 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 I really think that the, the virus is changing everything right now. Uh, it's quite hard to say what's going on and what we, we can predict uh, precisely what we'll, we'll, we will see with uh, Xi Jinping handling the, the crisis. But I think we, we can say just like Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and Taiwan, um, it's, it's not the same right now. It's something happening. Uh, we can see something very different. And I, I don't think we can say, okay, uh, Hong Kong will be a, a, stress, a, a, a stress test for Xi Jinping, sure. And what we saw, what, what, what I saw in Taiwan, for example, it's some people from Hong Kong, the newly uh, elected from the, the, the district councils coming to Taiwan to, take some, to, to, to have some links with Taiwanese people. So it, it's, it's, something we, it's something underground and something will be very interesting to see in the longer term. Christine and Volker, on the Hong Kong issue, um, is it far away now? Are the 60% history, are we is it at the margin? Is it not, a, not part of a stress test? No, I do think it's not far away. I mean, first of all, we do have upcoming elections in Hong Kong in summer, I think in September, the elections for the LegCo, which is the parliament in Hong Kong. So it, it will be an looming, so to say, and probably ongoing. I mean, still a kind of stress test. The protests have 
currently not die down, but not su such a large amount of people have been participating lately. That could change quickly um, as soon as there is another indication, also local incidents, or local politicians. Now that during the district elections, for example, a lot of politicians from the democratic forces have been elected into this district council. They can use this venue to also campaign, to use finances, to really bring up issues locally, which are important for clearly important for Hong Kongese people. It's a large majority which have been on the streets for, for quite an amount of time. And overall, Hong Kong is, is really a systemic challenge. There's no solution, right? Because what the protesters eventually more and more want, because I think the leadership in Hong Kong and Beijing have missed the opportunity, for example, to, to, to give in to the second demand, which has been an independent inquiry into police violence, which might have been at some stage might might be still really kind of um Get get the mass movement get the masses from the off the streets. But um, the question here really is: Are they willing to do that? So far, they were not were not giving into that demand. And of course, the systemic challenge remains when it comes to more democratic elections, more really keeping the political the political rights uh, intact in Hong Kong. And this this is, of course, a very systemic challenge for the CCP. And it, there's no, no solution based on the current political system of, of the one-party rule. The cockroaches in Hong Kong have stood up uh, to the Communist Party even on the, seven, on the anniversary of the um, uh, foundation of the People's Republic. This was really humiliation for Xi Jinping and the Communist Party, and this will not go away. I quite agree with Christian. The Taiwanese have stood up uh, in the face of uh, threats with force by Xi Jinping on 1st of January of last year. Uh, that has been a humiliation too. But both these challenges came from outside the actual borders of the mainland. Now with the coronavirus, we have a challenge inside China, and that is why I think this challenge is so much potentially so much greater. Okay, that's uh, exactly the reason why we moved to question three. So your mobile phone's out again, please. I don't have the results of the Merrick survey here in front of me to compare it with what you are doing now. There are none, okay, good. Oh, right. that was pre-Coronora, so we can't have them. Okay, now it's your choice. How successful will China's leadership be in dealing with the coronavirus health crisis? We have number one, successful, less successful, not successful. It's always bad to have three options because the majority of people always takes the middle. <laughs> I learned that once. <laughs> Never take an uneven number for questions. <laughs> totally not successful would maybe be a fourth one so that we can <laughs> at least mix it a bit uh, but that's exactly where we are successful 16 percent there they will be praised for transparency and decisiveness less successful manage the crisis lose credibility not successful the crisis will fundamentally undermine ccp Legitimacy. This morning I saw on Twitter a video where people from Wuhan last night uh, in the skyscrapers where they lived, you saw them, I see most of the shaking heads, you know, where they sang the national anthems and said uh, Wuhan Jiayou. Uh, it wasn't really clear, uh, the song, but uh, it was some sign of uh, national whatsoever, right? <laughs> you finished my sentence, Francois. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have to do the Q4 at the same time to save a little bit of time, although it's really different. It's social credit system. Uh, what will be the nature and impact of the social credit system at the end of 2020? Three options again. By the end of the year, SCS will be generally functional as a system that unifies credit scores, punishments and rewards, far-reaching and novel impact. Where is it? It's not there. Okay, up there. Well integrated system. Uh, the middle question, partly sort of semi implemented system. Okay, up and running, only to reinforce existing regulations. Number three, loose and fragmented system and approach, no deep impact. Oh, no, don't do this. 40%? Okay, good. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I feel strongly about the social credit system and I will bore you with that one later in the session. <laughs> okay, well integrated, we have 20, 45, 37, so um, pretty well spread. Kai will help me to get, get back to that chart later because I can definitely not remember. So we go um, back here, thanks Kai, to uh, the question on the coronavirus. Christine and gentlemen here faced with less successful sort of model through manage the crisis, lose some credibility or overall credibility, hard to say. Uh, Christine, why don't you go first? Sure. Well, yeah, at the current stage, that's not surprising. Um, this is what it looks like. I found it interesting, though, how the narrative, at least in the German media, initially have been played. There has been a lot of praise, you know, compared to SARS. Beijing has been much more um, efficient and much more transparent. This video and the images of this um, effort to build a hospital in Wuhan within two, three weeks has been uh, copy and pasted multiple times. But lately, as much as it all we have more information about what has been going on initially that we had people arrested for spreading rumors early on in January that now we have multiple reports by by citizen journalists which is really a remarkable effort by the way by the Chinese people to really self-organize and to make up for the lack of information that um and the local leadership has given, and the mayor of Wuhan also offered his resignation, saying at least numbers in terms of people who left the city and also infections are spiking, and he apologizes for not handling this uh, efficiently. So um, clearly, I mean, the loss of credibility vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese people is there. I mean, Sabina, you pointed to that and, and others. It's, it's remarkable how much uh, anger, frustration, but again, also in a, in a very constructive sense how much information sharing has been going on within the social media. Really people very courageously go to the hospitals making videos of, of feared people, of crying doctors because they don't know what to do. So in, in that sense, kind of looking a little bit ahead, this for me has been a remarkable sign of Chinese civil society capacity in a surprising way, right, to, to, to give it a, a bit of a positive spin, spin ahead. So lose of credibility clearly in the eyes of the Chinese people, because I assume that's the most important lens, at least for me. Of course, also the international dimensions uh, in terms of credibility, how China acts vis-a-vis uh, -vis the WTO, uh, losing in the international community, that's also another important element. Of course, colleagues and others might comment on that. But yes, clearly, uh, currently loss of credibility is clearly already very evident because how they initially mishandled uh, the crisis by not being transparent. Francois, if you were still Beijing correspondent and uh, you would do like Chris Buckley and uh, just take the train or a car and go down there, what would you do for us to assess whether what you see on the ground is support for China's leadership or is an expression of dissent? I would just went to the ground and, uh, and ask people what, what, what do they think. I think I'm, I just agree with the less successful option, but I think uh, Xi Jinping and the center, they will use, I, it, reminds, it re reminds me the Sichuan earthquake. I mean, they, they will try to use this kind of nationalism. They, it can search from this crisis. And I think uh, they will use the same old trick, saying that the Chongyang, the, the center did not know, and they will use the mire of Wuhan on some local caters as uh, scapegoats and uh, try to emerge like uh, a power, uh, yeah, powerful, just like saying, okay, we did not know what happened. It's, it's uh, the, 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 the culprits are the, the, the people on the ground, uh, the local caters, and uh, we are going to, to handle the situation and we're going to show you what we, we, can, we can handle it. And that worked for 4,000 years and it will work again? <laughs> Volker? <laughs> we'll Volker? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, let, let me say a word to uh, what Francois uh, uh, spoke about. Um, 
I'm, I'm uh, exactly on that thin line between not successful and less successful. And I think I have good company. I think uh, Xi Jinping is exactly on that spot with me. Uh, because look at the way uh, they try to handle this. Um, yes, the mayor uh, will be made a scapegoat. But actually, uh, if things go wrong, he's too low ranking uh, to be the scapegoat. So now Li Keqiang is being set up as a possible scapegoat. At the same time, he symbolizes the will um, and the determination of the leadership of Xi Jinping to pull the whole responsibility towards the almost very center, but not quite very center of the power structure. He is not putting himself into the shoes of the person who is responsible for resolving this. He's taking the number two in the country, meaning he can always get rid of him and still remain Xi Jinping. Um, and that shows the insecurity that I think he presently feels. Will we really be able to handle this? If so, then it must be clearly a success of the central government. If not, someone very much at the top will have to be the scapegoat. That's why I think he shares my spot on that uh, thin line here. And um, if you look uh, 4,000 years uh, back, yes, that is a proven strategy, I think. Yeah, I'm just hesitating whether we should move on to Q4. <laughs> I'm counting for thousand years. I'm just hesitating whether we should already move to Q3, uh, to Q4. Uh, well, let's let's do that, and uh, we still have uh, uh, enough time later on in the 15 minutes Q and A to come back to the coronavirus. So, the social credit system sort of spread even. Partly integrated. Uh, I'm really doubtful why it should only be partly integrated, but that's my personal comment. The privilege of the moderator to say that. Um, the question is not only how the social credit system <laughs> controls action, but structures and directs action of those affected. Um, so which order shall we take to start? Well, Francois, why don't you start? Your thoughts on the social credit system. I'm very cautious with this uh, issue because I, I didn't uh, work on this issue and it's a very complex one. Uh, the kind of uh, articles of uh, uh, research I, I read about that, it's very contradictory. So I'm very puzzled, yeah. I, I can't, I'm just like going to, going back to, <laughs> Who's less puzzled? to Christine, my mountain. Christine, less puzzled, maybe she challenges you and uh, yeah, no, actually not gives you some ideas. Less puzzled because, I mean, we have various colleagues, but we have especially two fantastic colleagues who have worked on this extensively, Marika Olberg and Katja Dreenhausen. I don't know if they're in the room. If they are, please approach them. They have done a lot of good work on, on this, and this is exactly what they have been saying for a long time. Um, and of course, it's the interesting question is why? What are the and again, it's it's kind of striking in a sense, but it, it also then tells us maybe that you're reading some of their analysis. I think other colleagues are also kind of skeptical if the CCP can really succeed to to make this a full integrated uh, system. And one of the key factors of, is of course integrating all the data in one data system to clean it, to be able to use it in a way that is really meaningful. I mean, it's not only about big data, but it's also about good data, clean up data, and this is where people and also Chinese experts, as far as I recall from the research of my colleagues, are quite skeptical. Also, for example, that private companies are so readily willing to submit all the data they have about their customers to a central data, a data bank or data center. That's also, there's also some frictions uh, been going on lately. So I think that also really takes into account what actually a lot of colleagues also, including Chinese experts, are being doubtful of how much the system can be really well integrated and taking in all the different data streams from finance, from uh, mobility behavior, and to really integrate it into one encompassing uh, system. Well, um, like with the uh, health system, uh, 
social insurance system or the one or two children system. Whenever the Communist Party tried to um, establish something very new, countrywide, it took a period of experimenting with various variations of a future system, testing them, and then finally settling on a system that was uh, then really uh, for the whole uh, country. And I think the social credit system works in the same way. Uh, the Communist Party has experimented with variations of that, and I think the strategy is quite clear that at some point the best proven system will be established uh, countrywide. So I, I'm fully on the side of those who say this will be a uh, well-integrated system. This is well prepared. You have lots of parties, corporations, etc., who cooperate. The population gradually gets used to it. It cannot go wrong. I'm, uh, I think it will be a well integrated system. The one doubt I have is about the 2020. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. that's yeah. because that's the topic of our session. Because we don't know, we don't know the design, yeah. the papers no. of uh, in Jongnanhai, whether it says 2021 or 2020. Okay, we go for 2022. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, my, my, my personal take on this is also I'm totally in the corner of well-integrated system. It's like uh, economic zones, uh, special economic zones, all the idea of starting and testing small and then going nationwide. Uh, we have experienced that for many years. Or decades. Uh, what I take from the social credit system, the one thing is which uh, deserves applause is, of course, the added transparency on um, compliance. So whenever it comes to compliance, did you pay the taxes and uh, did you uh, pay your debts? Uh, that's the thing uh, I assume the Chinese population welcomes because that uh, there was so much of a lack of transparency. But the two areas where we don't really know how it affects also us as foreigners and foreign business entities are the following. The one is the algorithm. What gives me good credits and what gives me bad credits? And there are enough companies now who already now don't travel to Hong Kong because they worry they might have a bad credit afterwards. So the algorithm could be anything in there um, on free speech or other values we have. And the second is directing behavior, directing behaviors. There was a quite impressive um, short video on Plus Minus in RAD uh, two weeks ago, which showed how a small, medium-sized enterprise, uh, where the boss walked into his office in the morning in China and checked his own rating, his personal, no, the, 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 the rating of his company, and next, he checked the rating of his suppliers. And he had three suppliers, and one had green rating, and the other one had green rating, and the third one had a red rating. And he said, we're going to kick him out, the one with the red rating. So it also directs behavior in a way, uh, you know, we wouldn't do in a market economy, where we say if somebody has a less, uh, 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 less perfect uh, or less acceptable score in any data bank, the price would probably be cheaper or I would diversify the suppliers, but I wouldn't just go straight by the you know, idea that any rating indicates my uh, business behavior. So that's probably the part we should worry about, which also affects uh, foreign businesses. And uh, I think we even once talked about whether that should be part of the comprehensive investment agreement. The EU is negotiating with China on the question whether that is fair and equal treatment. Uh, when your uh, business decisions are influenced by algorithm and, and parameter. So that is um, that part on that. And I think we close on that because I feel the sense in the room that all pre three previous topics were much closer to our heart than this one. And that's the nice thing about China. What's close to our heart changes all the time. We had Hong Kong on the hit list two weeks ago, and now we have totally different hit lists again. So, we are good in time. I can see from Miko's smile that uh, he is happy we didn't overrun yet too much. This, and we were perfect on the technical end. So, thanks Kai for everything. That was uh, well done. And we have now open Q&A on all the topics we had up here and we did not have up here. Uh, I see a question back there. Do we have a free mic? And uh, the gentleman in the back row. You can have mine. <coughs> Where is he? The gentleman with the beard. Excuse me. 
Thank you so much. Roger Kramer's University of Leiden, thank you to the panel for a very fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, we've been talking a lot of Xi Jinping, and I'd like to, if I may, spare a minute for the 90 million other party members of the Communist Party of China. I do, um, I, I do think there's sometimes a risk that by only talking about Xi, what Xi Jinping wants, what he does, what he's capable of, we forget that this is actually a political organization that has more members in it than the German state has citizens. Um, can the panel uh, perhaps discuss the complexities of you know, dealing with that political machine and the far more complicated picture than the puppet master um, in Beijing who pulls all the cords? And then a quick comment on the social credit system. Um, if, if you have clients who are worried about this, um, I've actually done a 15,000 word paper on it. There's no algorithm at the national government level. It doesn't exist. Um, yeah, why don't we take one question after the other, unless uh, we get too crowded? We take we take three. We take the gentleman in the back and Kyle. Thank you, Jan Zalefeld, political advisor to German Parliament. I will. Uh, a decade ago, I remember that we were talking about cracks in the system, strikes all over the place, local demonstrations, etc. I think I remember briefings by the EBIT Foundation counting more than 15,000 per year with demonstrations over 1,000 people. Uh, over the last five years, uh, let's say at least our discourse has completely changed as I do not have a chance to go on the ground let's say, is it only our main image that has changed or whether the situation on the ground has really changed that much and that the grip of the central is so strong? Assuming there would be more visible intra-party opposition for reasons we discussed, any insights we have on the difficult who question in terms of the party structure, upcoming leadership, regional strong party secretaries as in the past, any of what groups that might be, maybe even individuals? How much do we know what's, what's likely? Thank you. So we take the three questions and then I come to you with the next one. Um, so all the three questions focus uh, on uh, the 25% we had on QA, which is the intra-party opposition or intra-party different opinions. Don't have to call it opposition that way. So what do 90 million think? Where are the cracks? Or is our discourse wrong? And who are the others? Um, uh, Volker is reaching for the phone first, so you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quickly on the uh, party structure. Uh, when I was in uh, China at the time of the 19th Party Congress, I saw an educational program which explained how the party of the future would look like, and it said uh, outrightly that it would be patterned in the way the mandarins were trained in the Tang Dynasty, going through various exams, party schools obviously, and then having the opportunity to reach uh, the very top. And I think it shows how much thinking goes into what do we do with these 90 million uh, after we have experienced um, uh, lots of corruption going through that party, undermining the authority of the party. Something has to be done with it. And this is something that Xi Jinping is on to, I think. He tries to improve the image of the party. That is his first uh, uh, task as far as the party is concerned. Uh, and after all, the party is the basis um, of, of uh, governance, as he himself has said. Party discipline is the first priority for governance in China. So it has to be a, function, a functioning machinery, even though the population is greater than that of uh, Germany. On the cracks uh, in the system, I think they're still there. And uh, as long as they can't be handled, and they can be handled even with 15,000, sometimes you hear 100,000 uh, uh, protest movements in the country, the party has proven that it can suppress that kind of opposition. And um, I think this is not where the intra-party opposition, if it is to be relevant, will come from. It will come from something greater like uh, the management of the coronavirus crisis going absolutely wrong, or of course the economy going absolutely wrong. And then what will happen? Uh, I think 
and this is totally impressive. This is not based on any any um, poll or anything, but from talks in China, my personal impression would be what people are talking about is the military and Bo Xi Lai. Christine, please. Yes. Um, uh, adding to what Volker just said, I, I do think you're, that's a very important point, protests. I mean, this is not necessarily inter-party um, opposition, but of course the capacity of the society or s certain societal groups to, to bring more pressure to the, to the leadership. And we still, we, we, uh, we had um, demonstration protests by two crucial groups in the last one and a half years repeatedly, not large scale, but medium, smaller scale. One is um, the labor students also we had students from various universities in China from the elite universities the Renda Beida also uh, universities in Shanghai who also um, kind of got engaged with um, worker activists in southern China helping them to organize strikes and of course got this got detected early on by the security apparatus they got arrested um, and then veterans soldiers so demobilized soldiers this is a group not not a large scale group but they're extremely well trained extremely well organized and then whenever they assemble once or twice a year uh, on a regional level and even in Beijing to march and to formulate their um, demands this is also a group which Beijing still pays pays a lot attention to. So I do think we have spe specific societal groups which still can at least partly be be yeah put put some pressure on the on the Chinese government, but not to the extent that it would really at least uh, as we can foresee for now to to lead to a, a split, for example, in a party split. Uh, who after she? That's a very good question. Um, we do have some indication. Uh, one one specific name now comes again to my mind, Chen Mingar, who has been uh, and it, it escaped my mind, apologies, who, uh, which, at which location he's now exactly located, which province. But he has been uh, kind of associated to be earlier on to be a successor of, of Xi Jinping. Then he has been out of the game. Now he's again in the media for, uh, has been in the media more visible, making visits. Uh, um, so we, we do have some names. Um, and the, the upcoming uh, National People's Congress probably will be an interesting venue if uh, to some extent th these names will be more manifest themselves more in the media for example so there are some names out there but it's fair too early to say if at all there's any preparation for <laughs> for leadership change which is at, at the current stage i think highly unlikely that xi jinping himself or the ccp is planning on that um, because he made especially the opportunity to to extend his not not as head of the party but as head of the state um, which from all what we know created a lot of inter-party opposition. A lot of people were not happy uh, with that move. But uh, So the NPC, the National People Congress this March, I think will be an important venue to watch out which names might come up more in the Chinese media. Will it be held? The NPC, if it yeah. will be held? Oh, well, that's that's a good question, right? The, with the coronavirus, well, I mean, that would be a major decision to kind of, I think the my estimation would be the, the leadership will do the uttermost to still let it convene, right? That would be a major right, because it would indicate a lot of travel. But I think that would be a major, major concession, really, if that will be postponed. But they might, if it really, depending on the situation. Yeah, that's a very good question. Francois, did we get our narrative wrong the last five years? Did we forget about the 90 million uh, party members? Yeah, because I'm, I'm not based in, in, in Beijing or in China, so it's quite hard for me to, to know exactly what's going on inside the party. Um, what I got is just like stories from I read, so it's not very interesting for you. Uh, I just want to answer the, the question about the mass incidents. I think yeah, this, they are still going on what the, the information we got from some NGOs based in Hong Kong, like the China Labour Bulletin, and they're still, uh, as you, as Christine said, they're still uh, strikes or mobilizations. So. Uh, but under Xi Jinping, the, the, the control on the information is so severe, so it's quite difficult to get information, for example, like before, through the social media, or you have to belong to some like private groups from WeChat, so it's quite, it's quite difficult. 
So I turn around. I'm sorry that you saw my back all the time. Uh, that's why I tried to get some questions from here again or from the other. Oh, was the one gentleman? Sorry, I forgot you. On the fourth row, the gentleman with the glasses. Good morning, everybody. Jens Bastian from Athens, Greece, the think tank called Macropolis I work for. My question is a rather mundane one. In light of what has been said regarding the virus, does it test the authority's capacity in terms of resource management? What I'm asking here is, do they have the resources in light of the magnitude of the challenge? We're talking about 60 million people who have restrictions right now. That's larger than the size of South Korea. I'm not saying that they're all infected, but it means you've got to have resources to manage more than 60 million people in terms of, for example, the health sector, hospitals, doctors, pharmaceuticals. The need for imports possibly has to be fully reconsidered in terms of treating if this virus continues to further break out. So I'm looking here at not management of expectations or management of information, but management of available resources and possibly highlighting their restrictions. Another question we can combine it with? Yeah, please. Um, Maximilian Kalkov, I'm a journalist with the newspaper Die Welt. I want to come back to the, <laughs> this chart about um, tests for the CCP leadership. Um, and my feeling is that a test for the CCP leadership is a very vague term. Anything could be a test. We don't really know what a test is. Um, and the issues on the chart here on the list, um, I would say, so Hong Kong, uh, Xinjiang and Taiwan, uh, they are clearly on the list of, uh, on the agenda of the CCP, um, but I'm pretty sure they're not perceived as tests among the Chinese people, as tests for the Chinese leadership among the Chinese people. So my feeling is that we're looking at China very much from the outside here and that like uh, we're missing the perspective from the inside. The coronavirus is changing this, I think, because it affects so many people in China on so many levels. So my question is, yeah, are we looking at China too much from the outside and what tests might we be missing? Thanks very much, great question. Um, why don't we take those two questions? The first on resources and probably beyond the healthcare resources, it's also food delivery and um, cooks in a broader sense when you have a um, holy sealed off city. So resources and the next question, if I rephrase Mr. Karkov, then it would be if we were sitting on the Politburo, what would be on our hit list of stress tests? Um, which order we go? Volker, why don't you? Oh, yep. <laughs> don't be so shy. That's not our usual <laughs> way up here. Okay, but uh, I'm shy because it's uh, impossible, I think, to know about the resources, how to deal with the coronavirus. WHO was quite satisfied with the conclusions uh, the Chinese leadership drew from the SARS crisis, and um, I think was satisfied in uh, believing that another SARS crisis could be managed, but the corona crisis may be quite different. Uh, we just don't know that. So I think it's impossible to say uh, yes or no, they do have the resources. Uh, it's impossible, I think, for uh, Germany as well. Um, the second question, I think the test, uh, the word test is uh, aptly chosen, actually, because in a country that calls itself a dictatorship in its constitution, a dictatorship led by the Communist Party, it necessarily means that every even minor crisis is considered a test. And from the little we gather uh, from the internet, you see comments even on relatively minor issues turn into a question, are they really up to it? Can they really manage that? It is, that is why it's so important, obviously, if there is only one person at the top anymore, that this person is beyond question that this person does everything right, which today at the beginning I try to emphasize, I think, is very much the um, direction uh, Xi Jinping takes and his major concern. But that means that it's, it's very hard to draw up a list of what is uh, a test 
it need not be a coronavirus crisis. Anything, a, a major accident, like in uh, Tianjin, uh, the, the factory going up in flames, or um, a, a train crash, can right away be turned in public opinion into a test of the system. And that is why the party has to be so desperately concerned with managing the crisis in a way that allows it to say, the party has done it. We got, we resolved the crisis. We managed, we stood the test. So uh, what other tests are there? I mean, Corona obviously is the one that everybody here uh, came up with, but others can come up any time, any given time. So would you say that it's most likely that surprises create tests rather than issues thought through and like like ta Taiwan probably is not a surprise case, but Hong Kong and coronavirus are surprise cases. Are they more difficult? Are they more challenging? I think that, that's a very good point, surprise crisis. Uh, I think that is it. And uh, Taiwan also is one because the leadership was quite, quite convinced that they were on the right track in managing the Taiwan uh, issue, the way they supported uh, the Kuomintang uh, candidate uh, in, in any, any way. And uh, the same is true for Hong Kong, of course. They trusted in what the representative of Beijing told them. Hong Kong is uh, under control, what uh, Lam told them. Uh, so it was a surprise, not just for us, not just for the Chinese people, but these were surprises for the leadership uh, too. These are the actual challenges, the actual tests that come surprisingly. Francois, what's on your hit list? Um, I think, yeah, it's quite interesting what you say, because I, I quite agree. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of mis misunderstandings between, for example, Hong Kong people and Chinese people, and uh, the way the Chinese people see the Hong Kong people. And I think we don't have time to uh, to talk about that, but we, we have to come back to the 1997 narrative about the fact that the Hong Kong people were so happy to escape to the British imperialist regime and uh, embrace the the, the rejuvenation of the, the Chinese uh, nation. Uh, so it's the same, I, I mean, in, if they see Hong Kong people as the spoiled chi children, and uh, so there, there are a lot of mis misunderstandings, but it, it comes from the nationalist uh, discourse of, of, of the regime, I think, also. So we, I think we have to see how the Chinese people react to the Hong Kong uh, situation, but we have to see also how the Hong Kong people see the Chinese situation. Christine. Yes, uh, thank you. A quick comment on the resources. I mean, short term, they have already, the Chinese authorities have already admitted in the latest press conference again, and this is, of course, probably would be the same in other countries. There's a shortage of supplies, medical supplies, face masks, food supply, obviously, is, is an issue which is also quite harshly criticized in the social media when you lock down cities. H haven't you thought beforehand how to handle this whole uh, food supply? But I think you're also pointing to a, a, a very very important point looking at the structure of the health system as such, right, in terms of why do people have to rush to the hospitals, why this is so much of a, of a focal point, because in China you don't have like a general GP, a general practitioner, which would be much more decentralized in terms of handling the patients, for example. Um, this is one issue also within the hospitals, normally family members and migrant workers will take over really to take care of the patients. My colleague Katya was pointing to that rightly. You don't have so many nurses normally in place because it's it's taken for granted that the family will tear take care of additional um, measures uh, to take care of the patient and this is a huge issue now again talking uh, about I think this is probably something to assess and I, I assume or hopefully the leadership will assess more from a structural level quick comment on the test uh, I do think it has three levels it's the availability of information uh, and the trust of the leadership do we have the correct real information to how much can we create a level of unity uh, within the party uh, between harsh measures or more liberal measures. And then of course, I think Maximilian, this is a very important point you made pointing to 
does the Chinese leadership have the same assessment of what is the test than the Chinese people? For example, are they willing to make some sacrifices in terms of locking down cities, which uh, from the perspective of the Chinese people would be intolerable? I think this is also a question which increasingly the Chinese people might be asking when it comes to health, to environmental issues. And the Chinese probably also promised to deliver on that much more because they, they sense that what we, if we consider something to be a test to our legitimacy, legitimacy or our grip on power, but might be then handled uh, to the expense of the health or the well-being of the Chinese people. That might, of course, then create some challenges. That's a wonderful point. Thank you, Christine, for moving from our hit list to the party's hit list to the people's hit list. I think that is a very fine line, and I like to take this as a concluding comment. And I want to finish in time, uh, but before that, I uh, want to thank my wonderful panelists, Christine Schakupfer, Volker Stanzel, and Francois Bougon. It was a delight to moderate you. Thank you very much. <laughs> but of course, it doesn't come without a housekeeping note, and the only reason I was invited to moderate this panel was because I was trusted in making sure you come back after five minutes of a short break. That's what I promised. And if you don't do that, I will never be invited again. It's your choice. Thanks. <laughs>
be great if you could gather again for our second panel. Please take a seat. So, after concentrating on the political issues in the first panel, we will move on to the economy, to the Chinese economy. Uh, the title of our second panel is Growth Troubles, Innovation Dynamics and the US-China Trade War. And again, like in the first panel, we have pre uh, prepared two questions for you. So please, again, take out your mobile phones you will be expected to vote in a few seconds. Our first question is, in your view, what will be your... Oh, no. For, excuse me, but uh, perhaps I should start by introducing our panelists, which I would, would do now. <laughs> Um, we have, in the order of seating, Bert Hoffmann there, uh, director of the East Asian Institute at the National University of Singapore and um, a World Bank veteran and a China veteran, I might add. Uh, next to him, we have Margit Molnar, head of the China desk of the OECD, also with experiences in working closely together with the uh, Chinese Ministry of Finance. And we have uh, next to me, Mark Zenlein, head of the program Economic Research here at Merix. So, and now, without further ado, we come to our first question on the Chinese economy. The first question is, in your view, what will be Europe's dominant narrative on, chi uh, on China's economy in 2020? And you have five choices there. First would be uh, market liberalization and opening. Second, China as an innovative powerhouse. Number three, state control over the economy. Number four, economic stress. And number five, other, please specify. Now, let's wait some seconds to see what is moving there. But we have, I think, a clear number one there, which is state control over the economy. And if you prepare, uh, compare that to... Um, the results of the uh, survey Merix did with 150 China experts in December, it's actually pretty equal. They had 50-something percent there also, and uh, state control over the economy was dominating there. Second, we have China as innovative powerhouse, and then market liberalization and opening, only 12% also quite uh, equivalent to the Merix uh, China expert survey. So you're all pretty um, sure about that. And that while we have the phase two coming in from the China-US deal and while we have the um, discussions with the EU on the uh, investment agreement. So I guess we will have, this is one, one topic we can elaborate on in the discussions. Um, then let's move to question two. And the question is, uh, what would you expect China's reform efforts to focus on in 2020? You have five options there, as you see on your mobile. State-owned enterprise efficiency. Second would be financial system efficiency. Your third choice would be the greening of the economy. Number four, private sector development. And number five, anything else. Let's take a while to see what your opinion is. <coughs> and again, as we see a trend now, I think the results are pretty equivalent to those of the um, 
China experts asked before, China experts here, and in December, we're quite sure that financial system efficiency is number one focus, and then followed by the state-owned enterprise efficiency. So let's move to discuss um, those two questions and uh, your view on that. Perhaps we start with uh, the focus of um, the Chinese economy in 2020 and the uh, development. But what would you say, in your view, are the main topics we will focus on? in 2020, looking at the Chinese economy? From a European perspective, you, you want me to answer question one, or more broader on the, on the Chinese economy? Let's go broader, and you might add okay. the European perspective. So, so look, uh, for me, uh, we, we, can, we can talk about the coronavirus, but I think it's actually we'll too, come to it's too early to tell where we're going. But in terms of uh, um, reforms, I think China will have, uh, will, will focus on digesting the, the, the phase one agreement with the United States. And uh, I, I broadly see that they, they, uh, they're genuine in that, but it also has a lot of implications. One of the implications is that you're going to see the tariffs for longer, they're going to be higher for longer, and I think now companies will start thinking about can they live with the tariff structure that currently is imposed on Chinese exports to the United States, or will they diversify? And I think now companies companies talked about it last year, I think they will start to move this year. Uh, and, and in terms of impact on Europe, uh, uh, it's European companies that will have to make the same choice. Uh, second, there will be uh, a continued emphasis on, on the financial sector. The financial sector is not yet secure, and it is a high priority of, of the Chinese leadership to make it secure. That will cause further pain. Uh, how much pain will impose probably depends on how, how much the, 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 the virus will affect the economy. Up until now, you could say it may be less so. The emphasis on reforms, on re further reining in the shadow banking sector is going to be important, but that comes at a cost because basically the private sector is squeezed. So uh, the third is state enterprise reforms, in my view, uh, but not yet necessary to the liking of many people in the room. Uh, China has a, a pretty strong program of state enterprise reforms, but it is all about ownership diversification, and, and, and it's quite different from the direction that, that if you want Europe and the United States wants to, wants to go. But in anticipation of a phase two, which in my view will not happen uh, in 2020, it will be later, it will not happen. They won't start talking. They basically agree to they won't start the talking. US election. Correct. Right? And, then, and then they'll start talking. And then, so it will be 2021 or even later before there is a phase two. Uh, SOE reforms, in industrial policy, subsidies, all the, all the big things that have been kicked down the road will be on the agenda then. And I think China, as it did in phase one, We'll start moving on some of the areas in anticipation of negotiations with the U.S. Just a quick follow-up. So, do you expect um, major relocations of Chinese enterprises? Um, yes. Okay. Margaret, what's your view on that? Thank you. If I could put it into a broader picture, um, China's economy is slowing, and that is not because of the uh, trade disputes and neither because of the coronavirus. So how to deal with this slowing economy, that is the major issue. And that's how now the major slogan is uh, to concentrate on the quality of growth in China is. And that will also include uh, talking about uh, innovation. So how to uh, improve the innovation, uh, the innovative capacity of the economy. That will be one of the major um, challenges for this year. And we've just published a paper on these issues on the patent system of uh, China, where we uh, based our study on uh, 8,700 uh, patenters in China. And it was very clear that no matter what size, no matter where in the country, all patenters think that the protection of intellectual property rights is not sufficient in China. It's uh, no matter in which group we examine it, it's always above 90%. So the protection of intellectual property rights is in the interest of Chinese enterprises as well. So probably that's not an area where, where there could be questions of uh, moving forward. So I'm quite confident that there will be uh, achievements in that area, big achievements this year, because that is in the interest of uh, all the players. And also, it's not just the protection of intellectual property rights, but also that would lead to improvement in the quality of uh, innovation in China. 
right now, although China is number one in terms of different innovation outputs, for instance, patent, but still there are a lot of patents that are going unregistered. Why? Because people don't consider that the protection under IPR law is sufficient, so they prefer not registering their patents. So a lot of such patents, which could be potentially valuable, they go unregistered. So, so th that is an issue. And on the other hand, of course, I'm not saying that all the patents that are registered, they are very valuable, because that's um, the other side that our studies shows that actually uh, there are issues both on the quality and also on the relevance side. On the quality side, uh, the, easier, the easiest measure is to look at the um, share of the innovation patents, which are actually the genuine patents, I would call it, uh, versus the utility and the design patents. The utility patents, the utility patents in China, they are unlike the utility patents in the U.S. They are just uh, incremental improvements on already existing inventions. So they are in many other countries they wouldn't be uh, classified as patents, but in China the majority of patents are utility patents. So there is an issue uh, with the quality, then there's also an issue with the relevance. So a lot of patents are registered just for the sake of registering it. It's because uh, researchers and university professors, they need to register patents to get a tenure or to get an, the next contract or to get promoted. So that is, in the, that is the issue with the performance evaluation system. So there is an indicator in the performance evaluation system for these researchers, which is uh, asking how many patents did you register. So once there is an indicator asking for, how many, for the number of patents uh, registered, then uh, we think that there should also be uh, another indicator measuring the number of patents registered and utilized. And that's what is not looked at at all. So that's why in China, the number of patents that are utilized, the share of patents that are utilized, registered by researchers and uh, academics is only 3%. Uh, of course, these people are not too, how to say, they are not working for companies. They are not to commercialize all their uh, inventions, but 3% is extremely low. Just in comparison, this uh, number would be 27% in Japan. So does that so, mean that we overestimate the innovative capacity of China or that we underestimate it? It's very hard to see where the balance is, but I would like to emphasize that now there are a lot of patents that are being registered, which are probably not valuable, and they actually impose an uh, extremely high burden on the patent offices just because of the number of patents that are registered for these uh, researchers. But on the other side, a lot of patents are uh, going unregistered because uh, that may be the, the real inventions because the inventors, they are afraid that they wouldn't be protected. So, so I would like to emphasize both sizes. So uh, strengthening the intellectual property rights is in the interest of everyone. So that's why I, I have no doubt that there would be improvement on this side. So I, I gave this background just uh, to, to make the case that I think Obviously. it's very important. And, and also relevant for the phase two negotiations with the US coming up, etc. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Max Senglein, you are... Uh view on the central points we uh, will see we will uh, see in 2020 in the developments of the Chinese economy well I think it's a uh, um, if we come back to the question what is it how what does it mean for Europe also I think we have this um, the issue of well dealing with or waking up to uh, the uh, strength of state control in the Chinese economy the role of state on enterprises in the Chinese economy in realizing that well, uh, China is not developing in a way maybe we anticipated 10 years ago. And I think this is uh, a crucial year for Europe. Um, we have, um, well, ideally the, the investment agreement signed. I think this will be a central role. Um, but if we, if we look at also at this question when it comes to innovation, and because it was just mentioned earlier on, I think China is also trying to show us or try to prove for themselves that they can break through um, the or contradiction of being an authoritarian state, state uh, having a, 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 a significant role of um, the state dominating the economy whilst being innovative. And we've had a lot of discussion, on, especially in the area of emerging technology, that China is already an innovation powerhouse. Um, but I think this is really an open question. And um, 
if you look at where innovation is in large part taking taking place, this is in private enterprises. These are in, in the areas of emerging technologies, but these are also now becoming areas that are of uh, national strategic interest for China, for the CCP, for the government. And if they still can maintain this innovation uh, capacity in this uh, under this pressure uh, and trying to anticipate how to please also the, the government is really an open question. So I think this is, go, in my view, going to be a, a very relevant um, well, a very relevant point that we're going to see uh, how this unfolds this year. So you all did not mention the coronavirus. Uh, in panel one, uh, the experts agree that it will have a major, might have a major impact on the political uh, landscape. Um, what about the economy? I know it's hard to predict, and uh, we're all uh, we we don't see the crystal ball. Nevertheless, you uh, probably have thought about it. And um, so, what's what's your take so far, and what could be possible impacts? Okay, well, let, let me let me Let's start. start I'm, I'm sure the others have thought about it as well, uh, and we're all speculating. We all overnight become virologists uh, from economists. We try to turn virologists, and of course, we don't know. But also, it's fair to say that at this point, we we, we probably do not know the extent of the of the infection yet. Not, not least because the test kits are not ready yet. So they're producing like mad the test kits to actually establish what are the real numbers and i think the real numbers will therefore be already be a lot bigger than currently reported that's not hiding information that is finding information that if you look at if you look at if you look at uh, the, the potential impact uh, of course it depends how long and how deep is this going to go but if it is uh, going to level off and basically starts getting under control because of the f heavy measures that are being taken now you would actually expect a fairly minor impact. Uh, right now, the infection rate is about as big as SARS was in, in 2003 at the peak. And uh, 2003 was a very good year for the Chinese economy. Yes, there was a, there was a dip, a, a mild dip in, in, in transport and tourism in, in November, December 2002, and then uh, the first three months of 2003. They bounced back quickly uh, uh, afterwards, and uh, growth in, in 2003 was 10.1 uh, versus 9.1 in 2002. The difference, the difference I see is that now, if you want services, has become a bigger part of the economy. Tourism has become a bigger part of the economy, and and if if you lose out on on the biggest week of the year, i.e., uh, Chunjie, the, the 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 New Year Chinese New Year week, you 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 probably can look at a, at a pretty big blow to to the economy, which which you won't get back. And uh, 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 the people from Dragonomics did a nice estimate. Uh, they uh, looked at 2019, there was about 500 billion RMB spent, or about 2% of Q1 GDP in last year, on entry tickets and, and, and a museum and all of that. So, so if you say, well, th that you can't get back. I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't go back and, right. and, and do, your, do your visit to, your, to, your, uh, to, to, to the Great Wall uh, because your, your holidays are over. So if you lose out on that, for the first quarter would be bad, but the rest of the quarter might still be okay. It all depends how long is this going to last, how big is this going to go. The measures themselves are, in a way, more forceful than in SARS, and the measures themselves cause more economic impact, ironically. So, so but too early to tell how much it's going to be. Mark, do you agree? I very much agree with Bert that uh, now the major difference is that China is very much now a service-oriented economy. So the contribution of services is much bigger than it was during the SARS. So that's why it's not sufficient simply to look at the SARS numbers and then to uh, project it to what would happen now, because now the economy is mainly reliant on services. And also, um, there is another difference, which is now we are in Q1, <clears throat> although I, would, I must say that the epidemic cycle hasn't uh, peaked out yet. But let, let's say if we assume that this quarter it will peak out, then usually uh, the impact, at least I'm not saying usually, but in the SARS, the impact was the biggest when the cycle peaked. And that was the um, second quarter of 2003. So although, although even though the um, SARS started already in November 2002, but the peak was in the second quarter. And then it was June, July when the government announced that uh, China has conquered SARS. So it was in the peak 
quarter when the impact was the biggest. So, <clears throat> and that was the second quarter. So the impact on this entire year probably will be bigger if this peaking takes place in the first quarter, just because normally the, the first quarter has a bigger impact on the overall year growth than other quarters. Okay. Yeah, I would like to add, um, and I'll, I'll take a leap uh, here a bit. Um, so if you look at the, the last quarter of 2019, this, uh, the Chinese economy showed some areas of, of improvement and there was much hope that uh, China would be off to a good start uh, in the first quarter this year. And I think it's safe to say we will see a five in front of the GDP growth uh, in the first quarter. So uh, I do think there will be an impact. Um, retail is an area and services related areas are, in, are both uh, growing above GDP rate of currently 6.1% uh, in, in, uh, for 2019. So they have been contributing to uh, maintaining growth. And I think these are areas that are going to uh, be affected in the, in the first quarter. So I think it's going to pull it down. A really crucial element, I think, will be once, um, well, the, the country wakes up again from the holiday season and uh, industrial production uh, starts to uh, revamp. Um, if the virus has been contained or not. Mm -hmm. And I think this will add uh, either severity or um, be a really mild case. And I also think um, there will be, a, a, as I mentioned, I do anticipate a dip in the first quarter. It's not to say that there won't be a rebound. So um, I, I, I think this is something where there's still many open questions and that's mainly about the duration of how long this virus and, and how severe the virus will unfold. Perhaps the last question for, for this uh, uh, round. Um, how important is it that these 6% GDP growth uh, will be sustained or not? Is this just a number we all concentrate on? Is it really relevant? Is it not for, um, uh, uh, for, for um, uh, jobs, etc.? Well, it, it's actually not that important. And six percent is 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 a mirage. Actually, uh, for for those who really did the numbers, you, you see that the NBS has revised its history, maybe conveniently so, but it has revised the history of GDP. So actually, China only needs five point six percent growth this year to come to this famous doubling of income per capita for for the decade, and that was always seen to be the goal. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, well, Margaret already said that what, what is more important for the longer run is is the quality of growth, is the, is the reforms, is the innovation of in, in the economy, all the, the and, and therefore all the structure policies that will lead to that. I think I think after this year, this year people will still talk about meeting the goal of the moderately prosperous society. But after this year, that might actually disappear from, uh, from, from the, the five-year plan, which will be presented at least uh, to the leadership somewhere in the summer, in the summer will be presented next year to the NPC. Uh, and you'll probably see the emphasizing of growth and much more uh, the issues of, of, of quality growth. So I think, I think it is less so. And I said it's less than 6% that they need. So, so they're not desperate to start stimulating the economy yet because of a possible impact of the virus. Just a follow up on this is, is this um, effort to um, improve the quality of economic development um, and if, of economic growth um, at the moment undermined by the um, well by fighting the uh, coronavirus and concentrating on other issues or is is are these totally oh not totally up but rather um, two developments which are not interconnected. Max or Margit, perhaps? Well, I mean, the, the, the virus is something, it's kind of a, a black, black swan event. This is something that just came up. Uh, they need to react to it. And um, you can also think it from this, uh, from or take that perspective, that uh, it might also be a good excuse to take off the pressure to maintaining uh, GDP growth. So it might also be convenient. Now, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going... Uh, this is, might be a little bit of a stretch. I think nobody was wishing for this, certainly. Um, but I also would agree they're not going to go overboard on, um, um, uh, on pushing up growth to, to, to above 6% again. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they also don't want the economy to stall uh, severely. And I think more importantly than 2020 is 2021 in the year of celebration of 100 years of, of the CCP. And I think this is something where they certainly, just for political reasons already, they want to 
uh, showcase the economic strength of, of China, and um, this is for, so for this build up 2020 is a, a, a very significant year. Okay, so let's uh, move to round two. Um, another two questions for you. Please take out your mobile phones. And the first one would be um, How likely is it that the US and China will make substantive, uh, a substantive pro progress towards a phase two deal in, two th in 2020? We all know that they um, agreed to start uh, after the US presidential election, so they would have to make the progress in December. Um, and that's probably the reason why a huge majority of you in this room is very skeptic that, this, that we will see um, substant su substantial progress in 2020. I guess this picture will not really change. Well, but 24%, a quarter of you says, uh, somewhat likely that we see progress in 2020. Um, and we will discuss that, but before we move on to the second question, um, and that's, uh, of course, on the whole Huawei debate. If Germany, if the German government uh, prevents Huawei from providing large parts of uh, 5G infrastructure, what is the most likely channel for retaliation by China? Uh, you have four options there. No retaliation to be expected. Second one, pressure on the German car industry in particular. Third one, measures targeted at German companies in general that complicate doing business in China. And the fourth one, deterioration in political relations, for example, high-level dialogues, etc. Now, let's see, this is moving. No, no. Oh, two, two percent, no retaliation to be expected. There is this option there, if you want to choose no retaliation to be expected. You could vote on that, though the majority opted not to vote on no retaliation. But for the rest, it's pretty divided. Um, doing business in China uh, with 40% and 30% the German car industry. Well, the ambassador here in Germany and also in the EU, the Chinese ambassadors already hinged that that could happen or um, and then political relations 25% so let's perhaps start with the whole Huawei complex today Boris Johnson in the UK will meet with uh, his experts on the uh, National uh, Council and decide what the British way would be tomorrow the um, European Commission will present its uh, 5G toolbox with recommendations. Um, do you think that uh, the whole Huawei um, issue and the decision in Germany, which is still ongoing, um, will be a major um, obstacle in the German-Chinese relations? We start with you, Max. G gladly. Um, I I think anticipating Chinese retaliation in this in this discussion shouldn't be part of the debate when deciding to use Huawei or not. Um, there should be a, a fact-based process that um, well, Europe needs to define for itself. Um, and um, I think it's also worthwhile to look at how other countries have been dealt with this. I mean, and if you look at uh, Japan, for example, um, th th there's a whole different debate. And uh, I would, if I look at these uh, these um, well, the responses here. Um, I don't think um, there will be a significant economic impact. Um, there might be some. Well, Ch China is not going to be happy for sure, and there will probably be some. Uh, maybe it did, yeah. Well, some uh, high-level dialogues might be affected by that. But honestly, uh, so what? Um, I don't think the the also the articulated um, or what the ambas Chinese ambassador has articulated on how this would affect German car industry. Well, the majority of, of German cars sold in China are produced in China, so they would also affect their own economy. So I don't really think this is a very valid um, point. And again, uh, I think it's really worthwhile to discuss 
the whole Huawei 5G debate, not only focusing on the US-China relationship, but also see how other countries have reacted and, and not overblow the economic leverage that China has over Europe. And on the on the other hand, there's of course also the US-German relationship to be considered. And in the end, I'm right. I mean, this this question doesn't mean that uh, the German government should be uh, should be impacted by what uh, someone could expect from um, as a consequence. But um, but it's very much part of the public debate that we shouldn't true. be doing this because China is such an economic uh, or important partner for uh, uh, for Europe or for Germany. And uh, again, look at other countries. Uh, where there is a whole different debate. So, I mean, um, there is at the moment um, 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 a scenario for the uh, the German government um, has presented, and st it's still discussed, but um, how satisfied are you with what's on the table so far? Honestly, it's a, it's an ongoing discussion, um, and I, I don't have the insights on, on what specifically has been uh, or is on the table or is currently on the table. Um, I think today will be uh, obviously a crucial decision in the UK and maybe that's also a wait and see approach and I think it's still a very fluid uh, debate also here in Europe. Margaret Albert who wants to comment on the Huawei debate. Well I like I like Max's take on this. This this is quite straightforward. You need you need to have criteria to to actually allow for for uh, uh, bids on your on your main backbone of of the next generation of telecoms. Uh, there's one aspect to it is that, that uh, of course, Nokia Ericsson doesn't seem to have too much access to, to the Chinese market, and, and, and that can in, in part also be debated. On the security aspect, I, I noticed people in the room that actually have more experience than me, but let me still try something. Uh, uh, and I, 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 uh, somewhere in my mind, and I'm an economist, but I sort of say, well, you, you should be able to more or less determine on technical grounds whether, whether uh, a system meets the specs and then have regular controls on that. Uh, but even those systems, and we have them right now all around the world, uh, they can still be tapped into, they can still be hacked. We know so because uh, from the US side there was a gentleman named Snowden who, who leaked some of the information on what is possible with the current infrastructure. So I, th I think in a way we're, we're over obsessing a little bit on, on, on the infrastructure, but at the same time it's a, it's a major decision and I think countries or potentially better probably the EU as a whole who need to decide on what is the, what is the security risk that is acceptable in, in, in this particular case. Uh, Margaret, you, what's your take on this discussion? Can you comment? As a multinational organization, we support multilateralism and multilateral dialogue and we, we do not support uh, sanctions or retaliations. But let's perhaps, uh, one aspect is, uh, should there be a national approach or should there be, uh, should there be a really coordinated EU approach? We, at the moment we still have this in 27 uh, or 28 minus 1, 27 countries we have this debate going on. We see the, the, the Polish government has a different take on it than the UK government, uh, than the uh, German government perhaps, etc. Uh, should we have 27 debates in Europe going on on this? Well, my, if I may add, uh, my, my opinion on this is, um, I think European unity in dealing with China uh, is essential. And uh, it will be only to China's advantage if every national uh, government in, in Europe tries to uh, deal with China on its own on these crucial issues. Uh, it depends, of course, when, which year you want to decide on this. And uh, I mean, the, creating that unity that is necessary, that will probably take a long time. In, well, in, the FDI in, went fast, in, so in, let's in, take that as yeah, a benchmark. Yeah. Well. Okay. Um, let's uh, move from the Huawei debate to uh, the trade conflict. And um, we had this question on the uh, US-China uh, deal. We had phase one, and uh, now we're sure that phase two uh, discussions will only happen end of the year maximum. But uh, let's talk about phase one and uh, what you expect from this and if you see uh, really negative impacts for uh, Europe um, in impl implementing uh, the phase one deal. Who wants to go first? Well, let me, let me start. So I already said that highly unlikely that phase two comes in 2020 simply because of the logistics. Uh, what is important, though, is, is, is a proper implementation of phase one, whether, whether this is a good deal or not, but having disruptions in that deal would be disruptive, i.e. Uh, one of the big impacts of the trade, the, the trade tension between U.S. and China has been the uncertainty. 
the deal gives some certainty. It's, it's certainty about around a bad deal, in a way, because the tariffs are up and, 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 and not everything is discussed, but at least it gives some, some certainty. Uh, for Europe, uh, the immediate impact will be, one, is to decide on, on, on China as a, as, a, as a production platform, but two, there will be quite a bit of trade diversion to China, to, to, to Europe from China. It's already happening. Uh, if you look at the 2019 numbers, a lot of the trade that used to go to the United States is now going to Europe. Uh, second, that will be reinforced with the 200 billion procurement agreement, the managed trade part of the, of the, of the, the market-based trade deal. Uh, uh, and, and frankly, that will come at the expense of Europeans and other, uh, other countries, Europeans, especially manufacturing, uh, Australia, Canada, Brazil, in, in, the commodities, in the commodities sphere. So there will be an impact on Europe from, from, that, uh, from, that, phase, uh, from that phase one. You agree, Margaret? Do you have calculations perhaps already? Uh, not for the impact on uh, Europe, but um, according to our estimates, the um, measures that were uh, taken since summer and until the end of next, uh, until the end of last year, including uh, the measures that were finally not introduced mid-December, they would have shaved off 0.3 to 0.4 percent of uh, this year's GDP in China. So that's how, according to our latest forecast, we had 5.7 percent for this year. But with the cancellation of the uh, new round of tariffs from uh, mid-December and also as mentioned by, uh, by Bert, the confidence uh, impact, probably those would a uh, little bit push up uh, this figure. But uh, now it's hard to say it's too early because of the coronavirus. We, we don't have any uh, information what would be the impact. So that would act in the opposite direction. So definitely there would be a uh, diversion. But there is here an important factor I think we need to consider is that trade is slowing in China. It is slowing because the economy is rebalancing. So that will be the, uh, that will be the case uh, with or without the trade deal or with or without the trade war. So given that China is rebalancing from investment-driven to consumption-driven growth, that means that uh, China's import demand is slowing because uh, China's uh, import content of its consumption is extremely low, while investment is very much relied on foreign capital goods. So this transformation will imply a slowing of trade in the medium to long term. So we need to have this in mind when evaluating, for instance, uh, the capacity to import 200 billion over the next two years, or if it's like half than 100 uh, billion over the next year. So trade diversion definitely uh, will be an issue in, in Europe and also in many other countries. Max, any thoughts on the phase one? Well, I think it's important to remind ourselves what the phase one, one really is. It, it's not a solution to the problem. It's, uh, it's preventing an immediate escalation of, of the situation between um, uh, the, or the tensions between the US and, and, and China. Um, my question about without even, I would even think about a phase deal. My question for 2020 would be, um, is phase one going to, or the phase one deal uh, agreements, are they going to really be implemented and, or is it going to fall apart? Uh, but I think regardless of that, um, I think it's becoming quite obvious for, for companies or companies will need to react to the increased political risks that their, uh, their global supply chains are, are confronted with. And, um, phase one deal, if it's upheld, gives them some time to, uh, or in, in, to anticipate things better. Uh, but I think when it comes to more long-term investment decisions, um, we will see this um, reshuffling of, of, of global supply chains. They will unfold. Um, and, and I think this is a really a reality. Um, companies will need to confront themselves with, um, regardless on how U.S. Um, or the phase one deal or phase two deal will, will actually unfold. Uh, last question before we open uh, for uh, questions from the audience uh, would be uh, we have another agreement uh, in negotiation at the moment, the EU-China investment agreement. Uh, what is your take on that? Um, uh, I mean, the plans are that we see in September in Leipzig perhaps or at the end of the year um, some uh, progress there, if not an, a full agreement. Uh, do you see the progress? I mean, the... Um, a trade minister of the EU, EU already uh, had some skeptic uh, uh, comments on that. But uh, how do you see, do you see progress there this year? 
I'm personally skeptic and I, and, and I hope um, just because there are some high level um, summits taking place this year, that's, that's not the benchmark. Uh, I think uh, it's really um, important and crucial for Europe's interests to stand up to their demands um, and to see some uh, movement also from the Chinese side in, in, in core issues when it comes to subsidies, when it comes to uh, the role of, of state-owned enterprises uh, and to ensure um, that um, well, European companies can fairly compete with Chinese companies. And I think this uh, should be the, uh, uh, or a crucial element of it. And that also requires to have very specific language. And I think um, this has been a reoccurring feature with, with Chinese negotiations of being fairly vague in the terms. And I think that's, um, it probably takes time, but uh, to have very precise language um, with also consequences uh, in this document uh, will be uh, very uh, crucial and if it takes times it's better have a high quality agreement than one that is on time that can be showcased uh, but is actually of very little value oh we do a phase one investment agreement well, well look i I, uh, uh, I don't quite know why the negotiation stands and I, in a way I shouldn't speak for this but but uh, it's going to be a very busy year and now the, and now the coronavirus is adding to that so there's going to be a lot of uh, attention drawn away from by, by the leadership. Uh, I'm sure Europe will have its hands full with negotiating with the United States rather than with China, because uh, uh, Trump in Davos was quite happy to t start taking on Europe now, and there's going to be difficulties there. So this might not be the year that you can complete a complete uh, agreement. The, the, the trade negotiators in China, uh, the ones that were at the table, they were probably focus on implementing phase one, because that's their highest priority. And therefore, they might not be necessarily available for, for, for final decisions in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the agreement with the EU. So I th again, the 2020 might not be the year, but nevertheless, progress can be made. The, the EU, Japan, and the US have clearly stated their position on state enterprises, industrial policy, and subsidies. By they have a common, a common agreement which was signed uh, among the ministers uh, in January 14. Uh, that's, that's a pretty, pretty big stretch for China. Uh, I'm not saying that there's not people in China that wouldn't want to go there, but at, at this point that is, that is a very, very ambitious agenda. And so then the question is, uh, uh, will, will, will there be enough time uh, to actually get there? I do think there were reformers in China, including the people that that, that the World Bank was working with in their last report on innovative China, uh, uh, that would want to push for an agenda like this, but the leadership might not be there yet. So again, timing is everything. Margit, um, a crowded year, a busy year. Um, also, we have the discussions on the WTO reforms, um, etc. Where would you see the most progress to be done? In WTO? No, 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 no. If, if, if we see all these this discussions, the EU investment agreement, implementing phase one, the WTO okay. uh, discussions. Well, from China's point of view, that's uh, where I can say uh, more exactly. Uh, we are doing now uh, some work of uh, reclassifying uh, China's outward direct investment uh, because the official classification doesn't really give a very accurate picture, especially about the manufacturing investment, mainly because of the classification system that classified everything that is going through third parties as business investment. So investment in business services. So we are trying to get rid of this uh, flow in the classification system. And according to our preliminary results, China is already uh, a very big investor for five to six percent of global investment stock. Um, outward investment stock and last year it has overtaken Japan in 2018 it was uh, almost about the same share as, as Japan's but 2019 it has overtaken Japan and uh, we are also looking at the impact of China's overseas direct investment on the domestic economy and unlike in the case of uh, OECD member countries where we looked at it about 15-20 uh, years ago when it was a big issue, the hollowing out of the economy was an issue because it had a negative impact on domestic economies. We see the opposite in China. We see that uh, overseas direct investment has uh, a positive impact on its domestic economy. And the major difference is mainly because uh, OECD countries' overseas investment mainly went into labor-intensive industries. And Chinese investment is mainly going into resource-intensive in this industry, so that can explain the difference, why it's not replacing uh, labor at home. Your questions to the panelists. 
on the Chinese economy. We have one question here. Let's go. China had been quite impressive in lead up to the Paris Agreement. There was a question on green economy here. Uh, in reducing CO2 emissions, shutting down coal, uh, carbon prices. It was a mixed picture, but anyway, the direction was very clear, and CO2 emissions were down. Now they're up again somewhat. What's your reading? I have my hypotheses. I think the leadership up the top level is very much aware of the issues, understand it's many of them are engineers, even better than many leaders in the West. But yes, CO2 is up again, and they're reactivating coal in many reasons. Is that a reaction, is that temporary reaction to uh, pressures, local pressures, growth? Is that a wait and see, see how others commit under the next phase of Paris before they commit uh, to enhance their NDCs? How do you read that? Because it is somewhat troubling and it's not just one year now. Uh, I think it's two years or at last two years that they're way yeah. down. So, so one, one of the, I mean, the commitments of China are to peak before 2013 and to continue to reduce the CO2 intensity of the economy. Now, uh, uh, it's not just for China, but the whole Paris Agreement, we all know it's not enough. Uh, and, and so China, China made a strategic mistake a number of years back when it decentralized the approval of, of power plants. And there are actually a lot of coal power plants were put in place that are now running at way below capacity. But one of the, one of the fallouts that it has is that it keeps a lot of the green energy off the grid because, uh, well, maybe it's personal relationship, long-term long contracts, uh, uh, even though uh, 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 renewable power is more competitive than, than a lot of the coal power, they don't get on the grid. Uh, that's, that's, and that's a, that's a big issue. So if China would want to push, uh, push if you want the grid into making a, a better market system for accepting, accepting power, they could make a pretty big jump in renewable power. Uh, but there's still, a, still is going to be a bottleneck. One of the bottlenecks that's sort of over time being relieved, and that is people may not like it in, in Germany, but it's nuclear. Uh, uh, where there's a lot of nuclear currently being built, and that will help a lot China in its in its uh, uh, reduction in emission. Uh, in 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 my view, if you look at the numbers, you could probably have China peak earlier than 2030. And if they really would want to push hard, they could do that. Uh, critical there is the next five-year plan. The discussions that will be ongoing between now and say the fall. Are quite are quite quite important, and it's it's something that that Europe, uh, being one of the other strong supporters of Paris, should really take up with the Chinese. It's something we can all agree on, and it's a it's a matter of timing and it's a matter of ambition. I think China can 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 peak earlier than 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 that. Those EU interventions, no problem. Any thoughts about on the emissions? If, if I could add a couple of words. As uh, we have mentioned in the uh, last couple of economic surveys, in China there is also an infrastructure issue. There have been a lot of uh, uh, wind uh, turbines built, but without a link to the grid. And that's mainly because of the uh, subsidies offered at the local level, that all local governments <coughs> engaged in building uh, wind power plants but they didn't think about how to link it to the grid. So that's one of the issues. And the other issue is that um, the suppliers of uh, green um, power, they are not offered um, by the grid to buy all uh, whatever they produce or that they don't need. And that's what we've been recommending to China for years already. And there is a little improvement in that front, which is now um, the grid can buy. So there is a possibility of buying, but it is up to the grid to decide whether they want to buy or not. So it's still not the, the ideal si uh, situation where uh, the grid would be obliged to buy from uh, independent power producers all their excess power. Any additional questions on the Chinese economy and the outlook for 2021? Question over there in the fourth row. I'd like to come back to the phase one trade agreement. In my view, in light of the details that we are gradually hearing about it, and some of it still remains unclear, I would actually argue that the tariffs are the new normal. 
the new normal between the US and China, and that it's tariffs that go both ways. These are also tariffs that can be reintroduced if there's non-compliance. Others remain in place for the foreseeable future. So China actually has an intrinsic interest as being seen to adhere to the current phase one agreement. But adhering to it means not only the spirit, but also in substance of the letter, that it creates huge challenges for European suppliers. Because the more China adheres to that agreement, the more actually European suppliers face consequences without sitting at the negotiating table between Washington and Beijing. They have to bear the consequences without having a voice at the negotiating table. So there was rather a statement. Your question would be, is this the new normal? Tariffs, um, the new normal? Okay. Well, I mean, it is, I agree with you. It's quite remarkable. First of all, it's quite remarkable how uneven the agreement is, and I, I, I did do the count on the 80, 96 pages, whatever it is. Uh, there's 108 times that says, China shall. There's five times that says, the United States shall. And then there is joint shall, the party shall. That's about 88 times. But it is quite uneven. Uh, China uh, did confirm, or if you want, uh, committed to a, number of, to, to a number of reforms for which one would expect to have in return, have gotten at least a mechanism by which the tariffs on its exports would have been reviewed. It's not in the agreement. So, so, so yes, there will be fallout. But there's one thing that China has done, and that could be positive for the, for the, for the European companies, if you want. They've actually lowered the tariffs, uh, they've increased the tariffs of imports from the United States, they've lowered the tariffs of just about everything else. Uh, and, 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 and the overall tariff level in, on China's total imports has gone up far less uh, than as, as a consequence compared to the United States. Uh, so, so there might be a little bit of that. But the 200 billion, as said, how that is going to fall, uh, uh, we don't know yet. And that will probably hurt uh, European suppliers. Max and Marit on the new normal of... Uh I think it's certainly a, a reminder on how dysfunctional the WTO is in the framework and this bilateral agreement. Um, I mean, what struck me is, I mean, the, the, that China shall do things uh, that has been mentioned more earlier is, I think it was quite easy also for China because a lot of the things that are in the agreement are things China want to do anyway. So it's uh, an, an easy concession for that. Um, what I find um, more worryingly than the, than the terrorists actually is, is having certain quotas that China is going to fulfill in buying U.S. goods. And this is the opposite of, of market mechanisms. Um, and um, really, um, in, in, in my view, the most problematic issue for, for Europe and what Europe, I think, at least should stand for. Okay. Just to add that uh, these tariffs, which uh, now are about 16, 17, between 16 and 17 percent uh, on weighted average uh, on U.S. goods, they continue to bite. And that will uh, be a pressure uh, to uh, agree on the, on the second phase. Because uh, although there have been some countermeasures, for instance, like the phasing out, the temporary phasing out of the export tax, or the increase of the VAT rebort, um, rebate on exports uh, to 100 percent, and other measures like uh, other tax cuts, but I mean, uh, still the, the 70, 16, 17 percent is is still something that bites. So if there is uh, one other question over there in the last row, please, the gentleman. Yes. Thank you. Um, Tobias Wolny from the company BP. Um, the um, political risk think tank or group Eurasia Group, in the first week of January, they always publish the top risks for the coming year. And uh, I just read the top risks for 2020. And among the top three risks, there were two China-related ones. One, which doesn't really fit into this panel, which is all about the US-China relations in terms of those political hotspots that were discussed in the first panel. But number two, I found quite intriguing. They say to them, one of the top three risks is the so-called um, great decoupling in the technology sphere. Um, the great decoupling. So, so this is not just about 5G, but it's you know it's it's everything. It's um, semiconductors, it's quantum computing, and so forth. Now, I was just wondering. They call that the 
biggest impact on globalization since the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'm just wondering what your views are. Is that overstated? Is it realistic? And if it is realistic, what could it possibly mean for us in the EU and in Germany? Thanks very much. Now, that's a very good question for our last round. Well, how much time do we have? Three minutes, actually. All right. Uh, so uh, I do believe it's a big risk. It's not yet a given. Um, there is, there's been incidents that would lead to also a, an automatic decoupling. And I, as I used to say, there's not, a, there's not a CEO in China that is not worried about being kneecapped by some, by being put on the list, the entities list, the list that you don't want to be on. Uh, but also there's not a CEO in the United States that is not worried about supply side risk, so the, the, the global supply chain risk coming from potentially additional tariffs on China. So just that incentive will work itself already through the system, and therefore you will see a certain amount of decoupling. If things become more extreme, and there are, there are more extreme opinions on the US side that say, look, it's a strategic competitor, it's a military, they, 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 we, we, we got we, we to contain China. That will, of course, be far, far more damaging. It will be damaging for, for China, because it will have a much harder time catching up if it can't use a lot of the technologies already, already, already invented. But it will also be damaging for the rest of the world, because all these smart Chinese people that, that bring fantastic innovations to the world, uh, they'll then have to sort of focus on, the, on duplicating technologies uh, with, with Chinese characteristics. So it will be a loss for, for the world. How big that is, frankly, it's anybody's guess. I, I made some... I made some some simulations and you would come to sort of a percent, percent and a half growth loss every year for China just because of that effect. But it's, but it's a guesstimate. It's, not a, it's not, a, not a very hard estimate. For the world, it would also mean a loss because technological progress will go slower if you can't involve Chinese, Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, uh, engineers and, and, and scientists. Uh, we're not there yet, but as I said, there is, there is a certain position, from, largely from the national security uh, uh, corner in the United States, uh, 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 if they start to dominate, that would lead to that. On the Chinese side, similarly, it, it's not the mainstream, but people also say, look, it's just a containment strategy. This is already a containment strategy by the US. We need to prepare. And again, that would be a far bigger extent of decoupling than we would see, uh, say, in the next couple of years be because of what has already happened. For the, the decoupling uh, risk, I, I think decoupling is taking place no matter what it's just a question is it i mean where which where are we on the scale is it total decoupling or a mild case of decoupling um, and i think one reason if and i don't know the, the how the what the methodology is but um the decoupling risk is not so much the decoupling in itself but also the the vulnerability and the unpredictability of china us relations and also because it's way more than economics so you might have uh, you have so many potential flashpoints uh, leave it in the in the Taiwan Strait or whatnot that will have spillover effects in the economic side and I think um, over the past decades it was really mainly about economics so it was fairly easy um, but the whole relationship and this reshuffling in the relationship between the U.S. Uh, and 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 China and indirectly also then also for Europe um, is really um, well entering a new phase um, and I think. There is a lot of insecurity in that, that that really makes it at risk and I think also very difficult to assess. And as I mentioned earlier, this makes it, makes it even more important for companies to assess this political risk and to, well, put their eggs, eggs in different baskets, baskets. Because if things really go south in one area, they might be really vulnerable. Decoupling market? So decoupling in the sense that uh, your source may mean it is not desirable at all. And once you brought up the semiconductor sector, uh, when you look at China's trade structure, you see that the two biggest uh, import commodities or the import products are oil and integrated circuits. And depending on oil prices, it's either oil number one and integrated circuit number two, or if oil prices are low, then it's integrated circuits are number one and oil is number two. So integrated circuits are a very important import product for China. And although uh, it has a, a national development plan to uh, improve its capacity in the industry, it also has a government um, foundations that are targeting this industry, but still uh, people in the industry say that it may, it may take a decade or even more 
to to catch up with with the the current top uh, technologies. So probably the coupling in all areas is not even feasible. A very quick addition. Yeah, ju just a final thought on this, because because if the if there is a scenario of decoupling possible. It's in China's interest to actually double down on this made in China 2025. So you'll see a more industrial policy, more subsidies, a more statist solution domestically, simply because the risk of being excluded from, from technology. So it's, it's a big risk and it's, it's one to be avoided. Thank you very much. And uh, please give a big hand to our three panelists, Bert Hoffmann, Margit Molnar and Max Zenglein. And now you have 10 minutes uh, to really relax and be here on time again. Thank you.
Right. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat. Wonderful. Let's get started. Um, one more hour left and a great um, final panel waiting for us. I thank you all for your patience and endurance. This is an intensive uh, morning and uh, I'm really pleased with the outcome so far and I can tell you it's only going to get, uh, be better in the next um, hour. Um, what we are going to do now is to change the format of the last panel. Um, it will involve a survey that we've conducted among 150 China experts in Europe, um, as experts from across Europe uh, with a slight bias towards Germany and uh, um, Western Europe, I would say, but um, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, a survey also that has been conducted in December with guidance again and great teamwork from Lucrezia Poghetti, who you will see on the panel, and Kai von Karnap um, in the back. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the format will be different. We'll be presenting the survey results this time, so you don't have a chance to give your own opinion on that. You have all the um, results, um, I hope, on your uh, chairs, or you had them. You might have had a look at them already. And then there will be a fantastic panel of commentators uh, with Norbert Röttgen and um, uh, François Godemont, who I will introduce in a second. Um, and then we will have Q&A for the audience, uh, finally, to conclude um, the session and the day today. Um, Norbert Röttgen, um, of course, you all know as the chairman of the um, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of the German Bundestag, a former minister for the environment. It's a wonderful pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming and making your way, despite um, very busy um, days and times. François Godemont is um, the leading French-China expert, a close colleague, and we've worked quite intensively together with Institut Montaigne in the past, so wonderful to have you here too. Senior advisor to Institut Montaigne, and I should say also um, a mastermind behind uh, a very interesting development, which you will um, deny 
I know um, uh, there is a new institute being set up currently in Paris, which is called Eurix. Now, there's a, slightly, a slight familiarity of that name, which I find interesting. <laughs> um, but anyway, you might want to talk about that later or not. Um, last but not least, my wonderful colleague, Lucrezia Poghetti, she will be talking and presenting about the survey that we've conducted. I will give you um, the basics of it, and she will talk about the substance. Um, so, um, origins of the survey participants, again, 150 professionals and experts participated in December 2019. It's, it's a, we have a bias towards think tanks and research institutes, but we also have industry, policy making, civil society represented in here. And if you look at the countries of origin, you have, as I said earlier, in Austria, France, UK, and Germany um, focus in here, which I hope we can, um, again, rebalance in the discussion, because I know we have fantastic colleagues also from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe in this room. So very much look forward to that uh, debate. And without further ado, I, I would like to hand over to Lugritze, and please uh, share your wisdom and the colleagues' wisdom with, with us. Thank you. Thank you, Miko. I will jump right into the content of our survey. Uh, and I will start by describing uh, one that has become a reality in Europe-China relations, which is something that we are going to face again in 2020. Ever since the start of EU-China relations in the 1970s, economic factors have been the main drivers of our relationship. And still today, the issues that we discuss with China more frequently are economic issues. Uh, but something has started to change. Uh, and uh, over the course of 2019, uh, we've noticed that uh, political issues have now also moved to the forefront uh, of Europe-China relations. Um, European governments have noticed that now they sometimes need to push back uh, on the political front as well. For example, uh, we see increasingly uh, Chinese embassies and Chinese ambassadors across Europe making quite strong statements to correct the political views uh, of journalists, politicians, researchers, um, whose views on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, human rights more broadly, uh, are different from Beijing's views. And just today, actually, uh, the Chinese embassy and the Chinese Chamber of Commerce in Denmark asked for an apology to the Danish newspaper uh, Jill and Poston for, a, for an illustration uh, that links the PRC flag with the corona uh, virus. So uh, it's quite interesting indeed that uh, the majority of the respondents uh, when asked about which among these issues is most likely going to strain EU-China relations in 2020 told us that it is Beijing's politically motivated retaliation targeting our governments and our companies. And that came before uh, uh, a long-standing issues of uh, MACA taxes. Um, so quite interesting that now political issues have moved to the forefront and they are just as important as economic issues. And perhaps against that backdrop is not that surprising that, as you can see, very few among the European experts that we've surveyed uh, think that we will see any improvement in either economic or political relations between the EU and China in the year ahead. But what I find more interesting uh, about this uh, graphic that you can see is that actually about 60% uh, if you combine the first two bars on the political level uh, of respondents think that political relations are going to deteriorate or at least slightly deteriorate in 2020. At the same time, more than half of respondents think that uh, economic relations will remain stable. So one could argue that Europeans are quite ambitious. They want to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, but actually, if you look at the case of Sweden, uh, this might be a realistic uh, outlook. So hot economics, cold politics might become a defining feature of Europe-China relations going forward. Um, as you all know, uh, Sweden and China, in terms of diplomatic relations, things have been going worse, mostly because of China's illegal detention of Swedish citizen Guay Minhai. And uh, despite continuous threat by the most vocal Chinese ambassador in Europe, uh, things so far have not affected trade and investment. But there are different scenarios. And one scenario that I find important to mention is that of countries like the Czech Republic, where the issue of retaliation in economic terms might not be an issue at all. Uh, when, the, when Prague City Council uh, decided to terminate the sister city agreement with Beijing over the one China policy, the general assessment was that there simply wasn't that much to lose in economic terms. Uh, to the point, indeed, that, uh, as you might have heard, uh, President Zeman, who have been 
the main proponent of closer political ties with Beijing, will not attend this year's 17 plus one summit uh, as a sign of protest because of uh, China not fulfilling its promises in uh, investment. And what the Czech case tells us is another lesson that I think European governments can draw on from the Czech Republic, which is that political, close political ties with Beijing do not necessarily translate into economic opportunities. That's something that the Italian government has tried to do last year by signing an MOU on the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's also starting to feel something very similar to what countries in Eastern Europe have been uh, experiencing. And there's a third scenario as well, and that's already been discussed in the earlier panel, and that's the case of countries like Germany, whose economy has grown more dependent uh, on the Chinese market. So when, uh, German, when the Chinese ambassador here sends veiled threats about targeting German car exports to China, those threats sound much more realistic uh, to uh, the eyes of the Germans. Um, and uh, indeed, I think uh, this is something that we are seeing in the Huawei debate here, and it will be a test uh, also for uh, Germany in terms of its leadership on a unified China policy, because Germany needs to show that it can act strategically and that it cannot be just dominated by short-term economic interests. And this is especially important as uh, last year, Germany, together with France, have been promoting themselves as the drivers of a more unified China policy. And uh, as you can see here, actually, most of respondents think that it is the European Commission that is better suited to lead in promoting a unified European China policy, which is something that I don't find particularly surprising, but nevertheless, I would of course be very interested to hear anything that Goodman and Rotgen might have to say about this. Uh, but things are not looking great for Germany on the Leipzig front either. Uh, as you know, uh, among the main reasons for Germany to organize the Leipzig summit, uh, there is uh, basically 17 plus 1, so making sure that 17 plus 1 becomes irrelevant and unnecessary by providing a platform for all the EU member state leaders to meet with Xi Jinping. And second of all, one of the main reasons is also, we've heard this before uh, today, is providing a platform to get to the signature of the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Now, on both fronts, uh, we've seen quite a few interesting movements. Uh, the 17 plus 1 summit has actually been upgraded, so they see it will take place in China and it's going to be chaired by Xi Jinping himself. And we've heard already that negotiations on the bilateral investment treaty are not going so well. Uh, and actually, just two weeks ago, Business Europe in its new report reminded us and advised against rushing into a bad deal and to prioritize substance over timing. And what is interesting is that these two uh, news items uh, actually came out after we had already closed uh, our survey. So it's quite interesting, including considering the German buyers of our survey, that if you leave aside the large major majority of indecisive who said it's somewhat likely that the Leipzig summit will foster European unity, you are left with a very substantial, not likely, much more substantial than less than 5% who think that it is very likely. But let me also say that uh, the skepticism of the European experts that we've surveyed uh, is not just about um, like the Leipzig summit and it's not just about uh, German leadership on any EU-China policy. Uh, it's quite broadly extending to any prospects of breakthrough on EU-China relations, on EU-China stated goals. Uh, I've already mentioned that the comprehensive agreement on investment has not been looking good in terms of negotiations, although quite a few think that after all we, we might end up being able to sign uh, the agreement this year, uh, but fewer people think that we will uh, see any visible cooperation on our uh, climate goals and even fewer on reforming the WTO, whereas the large majority of respondents think that there shall be no breakthrough uh, in EU-China relations uh, this year. And what all this skepticism is quite in stark contrast with this narrative that has picked up in the media about China making 2020 its year of Europe. Because if China is making 2020 its year of Europe, then why are we so negative? Um, and... I, uh, as you can see, uh, again, uh, actually the message went down, uh, it, it was received quite well among European experts that we serve it. They do believe uh, that China will actually make deepening strategic relations with Europe a priority uh, in 2020, uh, especially against the, the backdrop of uh, growing tensions with the uh, United States. Uh, in December, Wang Yi was in Brussels and he said specifically that Europe uh, is going to be a priority on China's diplomatic agenda. And as you know, last year, China 
China also appointed toward the end of the year its first special envoy on European affairs, Chinese ambassador Wu Um So it obviously signaled this, but nevertheless, we felt like asking this question to our experts because we know that there tends to be a bit of a gap between what China says and what it does. And again, uh, actually, most respondents think that it is somewhat or very likely uh, that China will uh, make us a priority. Um, at the same time, now we know that... Uh, not much has changed so far in China's behavior. And in addition to that, uh, the signature of a first phase trade deal with the United States also takes some pressure of Beijing to pursue better friendships uh, in Europe. So against this backdrop, I would argue that uh, instead of focusing and making too much out of these uh, Euro China's year of Europe narrative, we should focus instead on what we can do uh, in our own China policy and sharpening our own responses. Um, and something that came out very clearly uh, and that you can see here is basically the need for an industrial and EU industrial policy to get the relationship right and more in general, investing in industrial innovation capabilities. Um, I do want to point out that it's quite interesting uh, that human rights policy came as uh, the last, uh, even after the other, the alternative answer. And I, for the sake of discussion, want to challenge uh, this result and say that if we want to be geopolitical, uh, we cannot only focus on internal policies. We have to focus on external policies as well, and we have to focus also on policies that promote our values. And actually, I find myself in agreement with quite a few among those who provide an alternative answer, who say that ultimately we need an integrated China strategy that links up issues across domains. And on this, I am going to conclude, and I hope we have enough to talk about. Thank you. I would like to invite you. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Lucrezia. That has been extremely instructive, and I would like to ask um, our colleagues, uh, and I would like to start with Norbert Rutgen, to kick, off us, uh, kick us off with an, uh, a short assessment of what you think um, should be our priorities and what, from where you sit currently, and um, as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, need to be priorities in our German-China policy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you so much for the enlightening insights you have conveyed to us, um, which in a way, however, were not really uh, surprising, but of course the question is how are we going to deal with what you have found out? Uh, perhaps a very, very brief summary from my perspective. What you mentioned is that there is a change in perception ongoing and underway in this country, and I would say more or less across Europe. Um, and this, I think we could say there is a new realism in how to deal with China. This is something which is new for us, and I think we will now see more and more, I hope so, but I think we will, we are quite likely to see more and more consequences drawn out of this new realistic perception of China. I think this new, this new perception uh, reflects a new reality in China. The China of Xi Jinping is not the China we have seen before. We know all the elements of Xi rule, its concentration of power uh, in the person of Xi Jinping, uh, its, 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 its more state intervention, its less market economy elements, in the Chinese economy, uh, and it's of course massive uh, digitalized uh, uh, suppression internally, and a projection of power abroad through different means in the South China Sea, Belt and Road, uh, digital projects, uh, and so on, which we are going to see. I think we are very likely to see basically no change in China. I do not expect any kind of major policy shift, shift in, in, in China. So to summarize, I would say we will are going to see uh, in, in, the, in, in 2020 uh, Xi getting stronger, the market economy in China getting weaker, 
and political relations, particularly with the West and the Europeans, worse. What we are going to see is a battle, for example, in this country, um, how to respond to this strategic challenge, um, how to deal with this challenge, and it is a battle between a policy which pursues the concept of sovereignty and resilience based on the three areas of how we deal with China, which is partnership, competitorship, and rivalry on the one side, and the other side is how to deal uh, uh, and how to assess the policy of retaliation, or the threat with retaliation. I think this is really, and there, particularly this country, which has a lead effect on other, on the, on the process of uh, a decision process, decision making process on Europe, is how are we going to decide between the threat of retaliation if we are going to decide for our resilience and our competitiveness, which is based on innovation. Perhaps I would uh, finally mention these uh, or three strategic approaches, how to deal with China on the different levels. I think to uh, retain, and, uh, 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 retain the, the partnership level for, uh, with China, it's essential that we insist on the principle of reciprocity an important principle, and apply this for 5G and you have a clear consequence. Regarding the level of uh, China being a competitor, I think innovation and technology is absolutely crucial. I think the reality today is that we need China, but that also China needs us. But this is only based, mainly based, on the technological competitiveness of Germany and other countries. And my fear is that this window is closing, that China is progressing in achieving more and more technological leadership, and we are stagnating. So giving up on the 5G uh, technology would fundamentally, strategically, uh, uh, weaken our political competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China. And the third element, how to deal with China as a systemic rival, it is based on the two other levels, being strong on these levels. I think the approach there is European solidarity against blackmailing uh, 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 in order to develop on a common basis uh, technologies, uh, to have a big market uh, in which European companies can prosper. And all this shows that the 5G debate really and absolutely is an absolutely important strategic decision ahead of us. Thank you. Uh, we, we have a slide later on the 5G question, which you also have in your um, um, handout, I think. But I would like to turn to Francois for a second um, and invite you to comment uh, certainly on your broader perspective of issues, um, also the realist approach uh, to China. But if I may also ask you to provide a French perspective on things and help us out in understanding how things look, at, uh, look uh, from Paris which I will try. Uh, but first reminding you that uh, Norbert is a key policy actor. I'm a kind of backroom observer. Uh, oh. I approved 100% what Lucrezia, how Lucrezia commented the slides. I'm also in the tough position of having advised for things that are now becoming real in terms of policy, but having to stand apart from it and watch the development. And of course, I'm more sensitive than others to the nuances and to the difficulties of implementing these policies. This is where we are now. And I'll quote Charles Dickens, you know, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times, it was an age of wisdom, it was an age of folly. The way we look at the European Union and the way it, it deals with China is fully encapsulated by that maxim. The EU does better, I'm going to be optimistic first, does better than any other moment in its history about China. It's been moving on several key issues. It's been moving faster. Now, fast for the EU is still a tortoise uh, walk if you compare it to when the, U when the US does a U-turn, as 
Trump did, and let's look at the CFUs <laughs> developments. But the EU is what it is. It's a political animal. It's not a federation. It's got 28 or 27 heads plus plus. Uh, so the developments, for example, on investment screening, the developments on, 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 on new uh, trade measures, things being contemplated, which I think are pretty important also on lobbying and undue influence on, on, on decisions, uh, that's quite, quite important. The change of, vacu of vocabulary, which happened with the March 12 communication. The first case uh, of EU leaders being able to tell the Chinese advance, you're not going to get what you want unless you agree to talk and to, and to give us things that you've promised before. That was the case before the June uh, summit uh, with the EU. And, and, and OK, uh, maybe it's, uh, the, 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 the Hill has given only a uh, small result, but even the civil aviation ag agreement, for example, and even the geographical indication uh, agreement are, are, are small but real victories of things that the Chinese were managing to hold up for one reason or another. So it's possible. Uh, by the way, if you look at the phase one agreement, the 94 pages that Bert Hoffman was talking about, there is a snippet there where the US commits China, China shall indeed submit to the US measures taken on geographical indication to check that it doesn't contradict the US thesis on generic uh, products. So we have the extraordinary case of the US using the agreement uh, with China to sort of downplay the agreement that the EU has signed. It's a triangle, I'm gonna come back to that. That's very important uh, and we have to stand up to that uh, triangle. So this is the optimistic part. Uh, the other uh, reasons for optimism, have been, they, they have been mentioned by Norbert. I would define it differently. I would say even when people kowtow or, 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 or just cede to lobbying pressures from China, they know why they're doing it. That is the illusions, the uh, talk about you know, China joining, converging uh, on norms and so forth has abated. We have a much more rational debate based sometimes on interest, not very often. Sometimes on values, I mean, not very often. Much more often on interest, but at least it's a real debate, and it's important. Uh, it's out. Uh, there are misconceptions. If you look at the 5G debate, I find that misinformation uh, is still around, but it's misinformation that's also carried by people who have such an interest uh, into the issue that you understand why they do it, and intelligent people should understand, for example, that they notion of a five or ten years delay uh, is not real, but it's a bubble that keeps uh, 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 moving about. So that is a change. I also think that uh, there is a Europeanization of policy, uh, which is not the first choice of most member states, but it's the only one that they see left because the problems they have. The turn in this country is impressive. Even if we, I'm going to take my French hat, always have the nagging suspicion that Germany is even more European to push what it's its own policy inside Europe. So we're looking over our shoulder. And if I was going to comment uh, the head of states and, uh, and, and, and you know, the high level uh, political play, I would say just that nobody wants to be one step in advance or in other on the wrong side of China to be suddenly isolated outside the herd or outside the twin in the Franco-German twin. And that, of course, sort of slows down the expression, the movement. Uh, you have a chancellor, I'm going to be very political and direct, uh, who is a queen of ambiguity in the way she expresses herself. And she has had many successes by remaining ambiguous uh, for a long time. Uh, we have a president who sometimes is forthright, but sometimes also knows to hedge his bets and not to do and say at the same time. So this is important. I won't go beyond that, but it's a factor uh, in relations uh, with China. The Central and Eastern countries is fascinating. I don't know if the 17 plus 1 summit, summit will take place in Beijing, given the circumstances there. Uh, I note that there is less, even before the virus, there was less of a flow of leaders ready to go to, to, to Beijing. Surprisingly, given that now Xi Jinping has announced he would chair the meeting, which I take it as a something of a slight in advance to the Leipzig uh, summit, because that, uh, how should I say, that exclusivity should have been re reserved to the summit with the EU, and he's clearly stating that he has not renounced 
uh, the idea of working in a sub-regional way uh, with organizations. So this is this is a real uh, problem uh, which which is uh, happening. The triangle. I'm sure many of you uh, understand it, but just to 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 remind you. China actually over the past two years has been looking in priority at its trade negotiations <laughs> with the US, I would say almost exclusively, almost openly. That's why many negotiations with the EU are stalled. No time for it, they will say quite openly, uh, which means our bargaining power or our threatening power is less than that of the US and everybody can, can uh, understand it. Uh, it also means uh, that we are facing the, the consequences of the phase one uh, agreement. And we have a two-edged, uh, a double-edged problem. One is to get the US with us on a number of issues. I don't think on any of the structural requirements from China, including all the measures that need to be taken about high tech, for example, protection of IP. I don't think we can, we have any hope of moving separately from the United States, nor perhaps does the US have the hope of moving separately without us because the phase one deal in spite of two or three commitments doesn't go very far. So that means if they are rational about it, they need <coughs> us. But if they are short-termists, they don't. Uh, and then we're stuck with our, what I would call the two-front conflict, uh, which is something important. Politically, it's very important. I, I am saying that under, under check by, by Norbert because it's very hard for any political leader now to say, openly that he's in agreement with Donald Trump on any subject, uh, including those where there might be uh, areas of agreement. The EU people who are not elected uh, will often say we are actually in agreement with the analysis made by the United States. Few elected political leaders will say that because, you know, the, the man discourages, of course, uh, such uh, figures. So this is an important thing. I am very afraid uh, of the, and it'll be my last comment, of the line that actually the two of you took, even though I'm tempted by it, which is to say we need the long-term uh, inner policies uh, of, of, of really regaining ground on competition with China, which is industry, high-tech, innovation, finance. Yes, we need it. By the way, we need it towards the United States as well. Uh, it's fascinating. And even towards the UK. It's fascinating to see these havens of free trade, non-interventionist, liberal economics for the past decades suddenly moving faster than we do uh, towards uh, government encouragement, new schemes to uh, include public and private interests and so forth. So it is a need. It's not going to replace China policy right. because this is things whose result we'll see in 10 or 20 years, not now. So. We have priorities uh, for this year. Uh, I would say that China is going to be in a less favorable position than predicted. Everybody understands phase one deal is a truce. It's not peace. Everybody can see for himself Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, in that order. And everybody can see that the virus is going to add a lot of strain uh, on the leadership. Uh, so it's not, you know, in spite of what ambassadors do around Europe, uh, it's not the best year uh, for them. Can we take advantage of that, leverage that and get results? Uh, that remains to be seen. Thank you, Francois. Um, I would like to invite uh, Lucrezia. We had a French-German couple now sitting here on the uh, panel, um, and I'm not you representing necessarily um, the rest of Europe, but um, certainly a, a, um, a expert on Italy and many other aspects of European China policy. Um, it, what is what is to that? consensus that seems to be here on that um, um, panel. How do you see that playing out across Europe and um, uh, where do you see fault lines emerging, maybe also with a particular view to Italy? That's, that's very interesting and I think it tells us quite a bit of what to expect also in terms of European unity this year because Italy last year did its share of spoiling a united approach to China by signing the MOU exactly around the time of when we were trying to push China with our own concept of connectivity to abide by certain rules. We need to acknowledge that the text of the MOU actually does include some EU language, but nevertheless, the symbolism uh, was quite strong. 
Um, what is interesting of the Italian case, which is more relevant for us in a European context, is that Italy is already experiencing some eye-openers. Um, and that's mostly because the main proponents of the signature of the BRI MOU, which was part of these a uh, broader strategy, which is not a strategy, of getting close to China politically as a means to open, to get access to special economic opportunity, that's not happening. So just as Zeman this year said, I'm not going to attend the 17 plus one summit because China has been promising and promising and promising since 2012 that didn't happen. And actually that helps us now making more the case also in Central and Eastern Europe uh, for a more unified approach and to really see, to really look at the reality. So I suspect that something similar is happening in Italy at the moment. Uh, the main proponents of the BRI MOU specifically said that the MOU would help uh, Italian exports to China. In 2019, Italian export to China declined. Um, so that argument, it never stood and it doesn't stand any longer. And uh, in addition to that, you start to see increasingly uh, different voices in the Italian debate on China from all political parties. And what has come out of that is a rather strong positioning on 5G. Uh, everyone might have seen the report of the COPASIR, which is the um, Parliamentary Committee uh, on Intelligence. Very strong, basically asking to exclude Huawei from 5G and making the case not just in uh, terms of national security, but also making the state subsidy uh, case. Um, so there is new realism in Italy as well. So that's good news, also considering that after Brexit, uh, Italy will probably be even more important for European China policy. It's still a big country and a big economy of the Eurozone. And uh, I think that's the direction that we need to build on in the year ahead. Thank you. We have a problem here. We have three realists um, on the panel, um, at least self-declared realists. So I really would like to invite the audience now uh, to challenge uh, everyone here on the panel as much as you can and you want uh, to make sure that we get a balance here back. and. Um, with that, I really would like to open for questions and indeed handing over to you. Thank you. Uh, Ramon Blackwa, Policy Planning, Spanish Minister for Affairs. I would like to uh, take on the triangle issue, this uh, menage a trois between the US, China and the European Union. And what is your view concerning the role that Europe can play is either the one that will tip the scales, or are the two uh, big uh, powers going to bully Europe into, or forcing Europe to accept its conditions? I'm talking about the famous declarations of the Chinese ambassador about reducing uh, exports or loss of markets that actually mimic the same threat issued by the American administration recently concerning European decisions on Iran policy. All right, uh, collecting more questions um, from the room. Herr Stanzel. On uh, 5G, what else? Um, basically, it is uh, or very much it is a question of uh, trust and confidence. How much can we trust into a dictatorial government? And um, uh, as we know that there is uh, legislation in China that uh, obligates every company to cooperate with the security agencies if need to, that means that every Chinese company is compromised. Does your position on 5G mean in the end that uh, we should decouple from cooperation with Chinese companies because they all are in a similar situation as Huawei? All right, one more question in the back. Unfortunately, it's the same issue. Can you but introduce Johannes yourself? Johannes Ahlefeld, so? political advisor to German Parliament. Uh, I serve in intelligence oversight, so I'm pretty much aware of, let's say, the security concerns. But we have other concerns as well. And one of the things that I was pretty surprised about, no one is, let's say, uh, taking account of the fact that 5G is for at least the next 10 or maybe up to 20 years not going to work without 4G. And what do we have in 4G? There's 40 to 60 percent, kind of depending on the provider, you are way in there anyhow. So in a sense, from my point of view, this, uh, this whole discussion seems to be a little bit blown out of proportion. Apart from that, apart from security, we have other concerns. Prosperity, innovation. The German government prom promised kind of full coverage in terms of mobile service, high speed across the country. 
without you away, that's not going to work. So we should be working on criteria to prevent where they can look kind of eavesdrop on us where it really hurts. Thank you. Um, we have the triangle. We have two questions on Huawei. Let us start, Francois, um, briefly again on the triangle question by our Spanish friends from the planning department and then uh, a lot of 5G for Mr. Redken. That's your day-to-day -day okay, business these days. Idea. Yes, indeed. I, I would put in a word. Please, yeah. yes. Uh, on, 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 on the triangle, uh, we are never going to be able to resist the pressure uh, of the US and China the way they resist each other's pressure. It's the nature of Europe again, so we will suffer. We are the underdog. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to give in uh, completely. I, I take a, you know, in-between uh, point. Uh, and what really matters uh, there is not whom we will side with, but how we can slowly build up more resilience uh, in several areas uh, of our economy. I mean, the fact that we, and especially you, by the way, uh, in Germany, are a huge exporter and a huge exporter to the US, of course, is a liability. Exporters have liabilities. So uh, improve the European economy, change a bit the current account, uh, the way the current account uh, works, that would diminish the level of pressure that the US itself is able to, to exercise. On China, I think there's absolutely no doubt that China reacts to pressure and to pressure alone. I think it's, it's really demonstrated by the last few years of, 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 of negotiation. And uh, so long as we don't have a more uh, actual coordination uh, behind what is now a more general agreement to place decisions in Brussels, uh, will be weak. I've been looking at investment screening, for example. Uh, one of the things that reassures me uh, recently is the fact that there is actually a lot of money being spent in Brussels to ensure safe communications uh, for information related to investment screening. That's essential. We can discuss endlessly whether it's mandatory or not. Uh, what does it encompass? If it's not safe communications that were actually very confidential technologies, it's not even going to exist to start with. So we are moving in the right direction. And I think it's more important than, frankly, ambassadorial uh, threats. China has been making too many of these. And I would note on the other side, and I'll stop there, that uh, Donald Trump's administration has acted as much as he threatened China, has often threatened Europeans, doesn't move that often for the time being. That's as optimistic as I can be mm -hmm. on that. Okay. On, on 5G, maybe I'll let, uh, I'll comment. Yes. I'll let, uh, can we get the 5G slide, um, which is the last slide, I think, of the presentation, just for context, uh, yes. um, if that's possible. <coughs> one, one further, uh, indeed. Um, so what is the main challenge that China's rise as a digital superpower poses to, in, to Europe in 2020? Clear answer here uh, from 150 European experts on China, um, infrastructure dependence on Chinese 5G network technology. That's a nice platform for you, Mr. Redken. Um, but, but again, um, can I ask you to challenge yourself? Um, how sure are you about that? Um, and what makes you so sure about your assessment on these issues? And I think perhaps w w just one word to the triangle. I think uh, when you, uh, Francois talked about the, the, European, uh, or the, uh, the Europeans as, as the underdog, I think you were not referring to trade. Because in this area, we are not an underdog. And I think this is a very, very important area. And it shows where there is solidarity, where there is a, a European competence. We are strong because we have a strong economic and also technological basis. Uh, to 5G, there were very clear questions. Of, uh, for example, um, uh, Mr. Stanzel asked, uh, is this a, a strategy or approach of decoupling uh, totally because um, China is a is a is a kind is an authoritarian regime, and this is then the case everywhere. No, we are only talking about critical infrastructure, and I would say about the most critical infrastructure, because five G is not four G. To refer to the third question, uh, it's 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 a completely different new world. It's a kind of our digital nerve system, which is the basis for everything, and not only for communication, for state administration, but also for industrial production. And to, to have a grip on our own 
digital nerve system, which functions in this interconnective way, I think is a, leg a legitimate um, purpose uh, of national and European policy, as it is seen by China itself. So this is not a general uh, trade or a, a economic strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, but it is a very specific issue how to deal with our so important economically and for security reasons so, strat uh, so strategically important uh, um, uh, toolbox of, of 5G. Uh, and so I think it's not overblown because there is the difference. I, 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 there is no, no, no need to emphasize it again that 5G is absolutely different to 4G. It's really a new world. It's not overblown. Uh, and it is of strategic importance for all the reasons of technology, preserving our technology. Uh, I think the, the, the case is absolutely clear that the European, if you want to have a, a European technological capacity there, then the European companies need the European market because of the subsidy system uh, which, uh, which the Chinese companies are benefiting uh, from. So these comp if a European solution, a European capacity needs a European market. Uh, the the, the self-understanding of China uh, is absolutely clear, and there is no, uh, no tricking about it. Uh, their understanding is there are no free companies in a Western sense. So there is only one big goal they have to serve, and this is the Chinese rule and national interest. So, and these are the, the, the arguments why I really think and consider this case, 5G, to be a very evident case uh, of our European uh, uh, unifying uh, overarching interests. Lukritza, can I ask you how successful or non-successful do you think is the German government in actually promoting that European unity on China um, in past um, 12 to 18 months? Thank you for not addressing the question. I think <laughs> Godeman... Not necessarily only on the 5G issue. So, yeah. oh. I think Godeman earlier said... Is this working? Yeah, it is? Okay. Uh, that uh, the question is whether Germany is not trying to put its own... Uh, talking points into the European-China uh, policy debate, and I, I think that's tricky, and I think European member states know that. Um, so in a way, this already uh, weakens German legitimacy when it comes to being the driver's position on a unified China policy. I do think that Germany has a big role to play. You guys are still the only ones, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, that have a surplus in trade relations with China. So that makes you maybe more vulnerable, of course, but you also have some more leverage compared to other countries. Um, so uh, you have a big role to play and uh, yeah, be mindful obviously that uh, member states are aware of this and I think uh, thinking in terms of the Leipzig summit for example, uh, the process leading up to Leipzig will be just as important as the outcome of the summit because that's where you get the chance to really talk at the working level and exchange your views with the member states, talk, get your points out there but also listen. Wonderful. We have room for one more question, maybe two more questions maximum, and then short answers from the panel and last round for comments. So, uh, Roger. Thanks to the panel for the very uh, thoughtful contributions. And uh, as someone who's been doing Chinese language research for years, it's uh, gratifying to see that China realism in some cases can mean um, taking China seriously for what it says itself. There is a risk, however, that in our newfound China realism, we forget that, uh, in my view, we also need Europe realism. And if there's one thing that I think we can learn from the Chinese side is their ability to uh, assess, in quite frank terms, the situation that they find themselves in. So I'd like to ask the question, if we are realistic about Europe as well, what are the things that we need to be doing pronto uh, in order to meet this challenge? All right, that's a wonderful last question. One more from Friedrich Stuck, and then I think we go with the last round here. Thanks. Uh, I, I take an additional minute before the question for one comment, and I'd like to jump on Francois' side uh, on the question of uh, how important is Europe. Um, and uh, yes, of course, we are the world's largest market. So in economic terms, we are huge, we are big, um, but we are a minion when it comes to economic policy making. Um, just looking at the example of Iran, 
um, we expected to continue our business with Iran. If Washington doesn't allow us to do so, our companies pull out because they are forced into an, a U.S. regime um, if they want it or not. So we have indications and you could continue with China and the U.S. entity list. Our companies are forced into U.S. regulation when it comes to economic policy. But my question is rather, um, uh, if we look in a longer term perspective, um, we have seen um, that some people in the Chinese Communist Party leaked the China cables. So if we take a longer term perspective, um, China, m some people in China, they're not our enemies. They are partners we would like to work with. We would like to change the system in China. So um, where are the limits to decoupling in order to keep bridges and work towards what we at the, at the time being seems impossible towards a more liberal society in China, more openness, um, uh, and again, more market orientation that the Chinese private sector is also asking for. Is there a possibility? Should we consider this more in our policies? Great. Big questions at the end. Um, um, and I would like to invite everyone basically to share what you think about them, including, again, the question what needs to be done pronto, uh, as I remember, and also uh, shouldn't we be hope hoping for change in China at a certain point because of the dif difficulties that we've both discussed in the first two panels? We go in this direction and end with Lucrezia. Pronto, and to answer uh, Roger's uh, uh, call, uh, we need an all-weather policy. I think that's actually what the March 12th communication prepared, but we have to develop it. We cannot bet that new policies on our part with elicit different reaction from Xi Jinping's China. It's quite possible that we don't move them. Uh, they take their risks, so to speak. They take their losses as well, preserving the system and resisting what they feel is the main danger to them, which is you, what I would call the US U-turn on China is more important. So we have to do our own policies. We have to, not to button all our hatches and close down, but to make sure we limit, we contain the damage from some of the relation. That leads to the second question. Because I'm an, uh, at least a former academic, uh, as soon as I see decoupling reaching human exchanges and students or stuff like that, I, begin, I become negative because I believe in human exchange. But let's face it, decoupling right now is not about that. It's, a, it's both a high-tech, security, critical technology uh, issue, and there the economic interests are paramount. Decoupling is happening, whether we like it or not. When you see the debate in the US, it's essentially about should we you know, dry out Huawei, which would not exist without our semiconductors and software, or should we look first at the sales we make to Huawei and limit uh, placing it on the entity list. That's a very pragmatic debate and everybody is faced with it, but it's not a debate of principle. Uh, so I think we should treat separately the issue of decoupling, which is really a hard interest-based uh, issue, uh, with the issue of human exchanges, how do you reach out uh, to the Chinese population uh, and to the elites, my guess about this is that the China, I mean, I'm not going to, I wouldn't have voted in the previous section for the notion that there is a strong intra-party resistance to Xi Jinping, but I have to note that it's not difficult to elicit from any kind of Chinese experts that you meet. I'm not even talking about ordinary people, Lao Bai Sing. I'm talking experts. It's not difficult to elicit a degree of skepticism at some point on at least some aspect of the policy. So wait and see. Mr. Uh, what we should do quite quickly is that Germany contribute to forge a unified common uh, European policy vis-à-vis -vis China. Whether this, um, this stems uh, from a realistic view of Europe and Germany, uh, we have to see and wait. All right, that's a clear task. Uh, Lugretia, a final word to you the honor of the final final answers um so the question on what we should do actually look at the netherlands uh task forces uh on economic security 
Um, one of the big achievements of the strategic outlook last year was not just framing China as, yes, a competitor, a partner, a rival. It also started to look at China more clearly as a political and security actor. Because in a lot of the member states, China is still mostly looked at through the prism of economics and that's it. It's far away, so it doesn't affect us geopolitically. So I think if we start from acknowledging that reality and work, for example, in the structures in our governments to set up uh, cross-ministerial task forces so that we can have a big bigger picture, uh, that could be uh, a good uh, start. And then I fully agree with the good demand that uh, on the society level, that's not the kind of decoupling that we want to go for, absolutely not. Uh, if anything, I guess there are some of, just to think of concrete ideas of our dialogues with China that we could rethink because those are dialogues like the people to people that have people to people in the name, but actually they don't do too much, unfortunately, uh, to promote actual exchanges. So maybe let's try and be more creative and see what we can do. Uh, to help this uh, function better. Thank you, and with uh, that wonderful last word, I would really like to say that uh, this is only the start of a discussion at Merricks and with colleagues about European-China policy in 2020. Um, this will certainly continue. I thank the panel. I thank uh, Mr. Redken, François Godemont, and uh, Lucrezia for excellent insights and discussions. And I also would like to thank um, the audience for being so patient and so uh, intense. Uh, and I look forward to continuing all of this here with all of you in the next 12 months and beyond. Thanks, and enjoy your lunch over there. And I guess thanks Miko as well. <laughs>